Green, you mean? <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, yes. All right. Okay. Good <clears throat> afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to our distinguished speakers, guests, GBF members, uh, students, teachers from all over the world. It is my great pleasure that I welcome all our eminent speakers and guests to this international seminar, the, the first in collaboration with the Regional Center for Education and Training, uh, SRMEF Rabat. I will be your moderator. My name is Asma Abu Faraj. I am a young leader and GB and the member of GBF. I am also a certified teacher of English. And I'm more excited to be uh, with you today for this webinar. So our second speaker is uh, Ms. Najwa. Can you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. So my name is Najwa Leribi. I am a certified teacher of English. I'm also a master's student in applied linguistics, English language teaching at the Faculty of Education Sciences in Rabat, Morocco. And also I am one of GBF Young Leaders. And Asma and I will be moderating today's webinar. Thank Great. you, Asma. Nice to meet you <laughs> again. And yeah, so for those who don't know, um, GBF is a Moroccan NGO that empowers people uh, from all over the country and all over the world. Um, our main focus is to help women, to help youth and people in general flourish. And we have been focused or focusing our works lately on education as it is one of the issues that we think uh, need to be addressed with the world's current state. Our entire team has worked diligently to establish projects and, and, and create them and um, make sure uh, to offer great opportunities for growth, uh, leadership, and success. Uh, in order to learn more about our TEFL program, about our ELT programs, or youth coaching, uh, please visit our Facebook page, Global Bus Foundation, and be on time every Friday for our ELT program, which is designed to help us contribute to the future of teaching and education. Today, we have brought together leading scholars, academics, and researchers in the field of education from the entire world. And um, we would like uh, first to give the floor to Mr. Slimani for a special word. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Asma. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, first our um, guests, Joanna uh, from uh, Poland, George from uh, Greece, and Janice from uh, United States of America. Um, I am the, um, the, the head of the Department of English at the uh, Regional Training Center in Rabat. And uh, this is uh, my first participation in this webinar. And I hope um, everyone will find it interesting and uh, everybody is, will learn and we will learn also from, from each other. And then uh, um, I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Slimani. And now, um, yes, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today, who is Mr. Uh, Kokolas. Uh, Mr. Kokolas always fascinated us with brilliant presentations, uh, and today is no exception. So Mr. Kokolas has been working as an academic director and teacher trainer for Express Publishing for the last 20 years. He is a certified level five TEFL teacher and a certified advanced uh, neuro language coach. He currently studies uh, positive psychology and how we can merge it with ELT. And uh, he has also delivered several seminars, um, conferences, uh, and talks in the entire world. Since 2017, he is the co-host and producer of the educational podcast, uh, Teacher's Coffee, which we would like everyone in our audience to definitely check. Um, so, 
His presentation today is going to tackle the topic of staying connected while disconnected. Yeah, so uh, in this, in our current circumstances, many teachers teach online uh, in an effort to maintain the communication we value in our classrooms, right? So social interaction is important, uh, but what true learning requires is human connection as well, right? So can we preserve the humanity of learning experiences while dependent on digital technology? Can we preserve the human touch in while being online? Uh, so Mr. Kokolas thinks whenever there is will, there is also a way. Uh, I will give you the floor, Mr. George, to give your first presentation. Thank you very much, Asmae. Thank you very much, um, Global Bus Foundation, Luisine, and everyone for the invitation. I think it's our third uh, in a row, at least for me, uh, webinar that uh, I'm participating, organized by you. And I must say, I don't know if you were so happy by my presentations, but I really enjoyed every single presence. Yes, it uh, in... was great and amazing <laughs> presentation, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lucine. Um, and since uh, it was mentioned in the introduction, yeah, we, we must say that we had a very small mishap because we had Mr. Caceras as our guest in Teacher's Coffee yesterday, but unfortunately, due to the, some technical reasons, the, the show didn't go on air. But but uh, once this is uh, this finishes this presentation, we will coordinate again with Mr. Luisine and we find a new date uh, because I want him to be and talk to the people, talk to everyone, because this is an international podcast about what you are doing here in Morocco, which I think it's a huge contribution to education. OK, allow me to share my screen. And um, as it was said in the introduction today, um, I really love this title because I think it resonates a lot with the reality that we are all experiencing. We all experience um, these difficult times of the pandemic. But of course, I think one of the major things that we should have in mind is that we need to embrace this disconnection. And uh, this is the first thing that we need to recognize and acknowledge. And I think this is the first step that we need to take in every possible, uh, for every possible psychological state, and then try to improve it, try to do something about it, which is staying connected while disconnected. I will start with the basics uh, because uh, I must say, I have to confess that I have been delivering this presentation for over one year now. And in the beginning, obviously it was completely unknown for everybody. Everyone was testing the water, learning the ropes. But now uh, I'm sure that you are all familiar with the online platforms that they are um, here and there. There are so many more. Um, the, you almost get like choice fatigue when you try to choose which one of the platforms to use for your own students. However, I take for granted that right now that's a really great game that we are familiar with all the online platforms that exist, no matter if it's Skype, Zoom, Viber, WhatsApp, whatever. And of course, regarding content, uh, apart from maybe the collaboration that you may have with certain publishers, uh, there are so many different educational programs right now and software that you can integrate in your teaching or simply use them to spice it up or um, entirely rely on them for teaching online. Some of them you can see right now on the screen. I, I'm sure that there's so many others uh, there. However, my point is not that. I will start becoming more specific. The point is, how do I maintain, if I am allowed to say emotional connection with my learner when I'm not there, when, when I'm not next to him, when I'm not next to her, when we don't have any kind of presence. And uh, usually this is an overwhelming statement because I think the majority of the time we were taken aback and we were constantly puzzled. How is it going to happen now that we are distant? We felt that this might be a handicap, uh, which might have been, and it might is, but it's not a handicap that we cannot overcome. The fact that we are not together, that we are not, you know, in the same room, in the same classroom, does not mean that we cannot engage and connect. Um, I think one of the um, basic ideas which uh, I came across a lot of time, and I have read a lot about this, and I can tell you that the more I read about it, the more I feel that it makes sense. 
and it comes from the adolescent community of engagement framework uh, a lens for research in k-12 online learning environments and correlating this triangle that you can see right now on your screen with other theories i think that if we are to look for engagement this is maybe where we should cast a glance at first which is uh, you can see this uh, amazing triangle the students are in the middle but in order to achieve the students engagement um, we need also to engage teachers parents and the peers so it's like a three-dimensional um, concept a three-dimensional process it's not only about the student per se because obviously when you're teaching online all these different aspects of the same triangle one way or another um, more or less time they are also involved so we cannot possibly ignore this uh, factor and the fact that it's happening remotely it might seem to be more complicated so to engage them as well however if we want our students engaged i think this is where we should look for try to energize try to activate try to push a little bit towards engagement all the parts of this triangle and that's exactly what it is mentioned in this uh, code there are three key players in any online learning experience, teacher, parents, and peers. Now, let's start, you know, um, having a look at these groups one by one. Teachers, which means us. First of all, you need to realize that it's okay to miss our normal. As I said in the beginning, the first step in any kind of psychological handicap is to embrace it, is to acknowledge. It's not about the circumstances. It's, it's a matter of perspective. And this might sound naive or perspective, but I think, uh, or simplistic, but it's a first step towards realization and towards dealing with the problem. The second one, I think, uh, not because I'm currently studying positive psychology, because this is not about that exactly, but I think we should give it a different, more positive twist. And I dare say that right now we are creating history. We are creating history because from what we, here from different countries there might be a light at the end of the tunnel if it's not going to be this september or october it might be you know after six or seven months for the majority of the countries due to vaccination of course and when this is going to be over and there's going to be a new reality we can claim and we can say and we can even brag about it that we have created history we we were literally pushed into this new re reality we had to design distant learning plans we have to adapt our teaching rapidly. We need to react immediately. And I think we did it. Because now even, you know, the most, allow me to say, computer illiterate teacher right now does know the basics and how uh, he or she could deliver a successful lesson. And of course, we should not forget there is another positive side. We're still teaching. Nothing has changed. Um, uh, social emotional emotional skills skills can still be communicated and um, uh, the fact that uh, we are doing this through a computer does not mean that uh, we still don't have flexible thinking and perseverance in what we are doing and of course we can always always show empathy and compassion which are parts of also the face-to-face -face teaching you know um, in one of my previous presentations here there is one phrase stuck on my mind from a friend of mine, Dr. Maria Davu, who is also a compatriot, you know, she's also Greek. And she said, the very same qualities that characterize you as a face-to-face -face teacher are the qualities that will characterize you as an online teacher. And, you know, I, this is simply, uh, I think, um, an absolute true statement that we should never forget. Nothing changes regarding the actual teaching. What is changes is the, the vehicle, the means of delivering. And the rest, the qualities, the virtues, the connection are still there for us, no matter if we are remote or face to face. And of course, day by day, hour by hour, this is what, that's exactly the process that brought us to that position. We gain new knowledge and expertise. There are so many people that they didn't have to be academic, so to become now experts on online teaching. I must say that there have been many people who came from the academy, 
uh, that they went out and they gave the light to the uh, to us that we were completely ignorant, and they really guided uh, us, you know, to find the path towards remote learning. But right now, in 2021, after one year, there are so many other teachers who are not academics. There are frontline teachers who know very, very well what they are doing, no matter if they have never studied it academically. And this is the new knowledge and expertise that sprang from this process. And of course, yes, um, this also comes from another great friend of mine who also she doesn't live in Greece, but she's, she's a scholar and academic, one of the first who talked publicly about online speaking. Don't expect to be to make to be uh, to make it perfect. Online teaching does not have to be perfect. There will be trial, there will be error, there will be mistakes, there will be experiments. That's the way to go. And that's the new normal. And of course, during these difficult times right now, um, after that, I have another seminar. Before that, I was attending another seminar webinar and many psychologists speak about trauma and about traumatic experiences that we all may have after this pandemic, the lockdowns and um, all these restrictions that they were imposed. And every single one of these people recommends one thing, share, talk, chat, discuss. And only you can do this with your peers because these are the ones that you can empathize with you. These are the ones that they have exactly the same problem with you. So please, please, um, um, I highly recommend and I encourage you to do this because it will make you feel better. Um, and of course, if you are able to share then with the teachers, then you can share with the other parts of the triangle, but it's important to uh, be part of this process. And of course, take it by step by step. There's no rush here. I know that there's a certain schedule, maybe curriculum that needs to be covered, but we have to take it very cautiously step by step and um, have a lesson plan. Everything needs to be scripted. This is what I always say to the new teachers. You must have a plan B, a plan C and plan D. And everything has to be there. Uh, your lesson plan should be your own manual. And of course, emphasize your presence through regular announcements and quick communication. Take advantage, take advantage of the new technology. I was aware of uh, recently of a new application which is called Ask Phoenix. And it's one of the few applications which you can communicate 24 seven via instant messaging with your students. And teachers, you know, feel, felt really, really amazing about that because irrespective of the platform or the material, this is exactly what the last, uh, resonates with the last bullet. Check, make sure, check in every time that you are there for them through technology, because unfortunately there is no other way to do that. And maybe this can be a way. And of course, yeah, well-being. Well-being means take care of yourself in order to be able to deliver. We are all tired. We are all maybe fed up. And it really, really needs a lot of energy to stand in front of the camera and talk for hours. It's so, you know, um, exhausting sometimes. So we need to take care of ourselves like the athletes. If we are to run the marathon, we need to have a good sleep. We need to lead a good life. And we need to take care of ourselves from this perspective. If we don't feel good, it's impossible to make other people to feel good. It's that simple. Now, for this slide, I will quote from another friend that this time comes from another nearby um, country, Albania, Mrs. Fidores Suleimani. She's the president of the association. And she told me in one of these interviews and chats that we had that these are historic times because these lessons that we deliver every day they are being watched by three different generations, children, parents, and grandparents. Because in the majority of the houses, no matter where you live, these lessons are being heard, listened, or watched by the whole family. And this is, for me, the great value and currency that we gain as teachers, and maybe a great floor for engagement. Connect with parents systematically, but keep it short and focused use technology, use multiple forms of communication. It might be a phone, it might be um, a Zoom, it might be chat, you know, it, just, you know, short, simple, to the point, because obviously you cannot deal with so many parents. But my point is make them your allies. 
show them everything, provide the schedule, the syllabus, the dates, the schedule, clear assignment, directions. When the cameras are off, they stay with their kids. So they have to be on your side. Take families' new home schedules into account because everybody's family schedule has become upside down. There might be alternative opportunities. You might want to record some sessions for asynchronous learning, some parallel teaching or small groups to differentiate instruction if you feel this is a necessity. There might be some kids who lost the session. I know that this means extra hours, but it will be very, very much appreciated, I'm telling you. And to tell you the truth, you don't have to do it all the time. But a couple of times, if you do it, if you replace a classroom, if you make a phone call, if you send an email, it's very much appreciated by the majority of the parents. Make sure to offer some tech support. I'm not, I don't, I'm not suggesting here that you become um, uh, tech uh, geeks or you know super experts, but at least know the basics. Sometimes it's simply a cable or simply a button that you need in order to be able, and they cannot participate in your classes. So yeah, this uh, offering of tech minimum support, we should be prepared to give it. Uh, and um, when I say make them your allies, you need to ask for feedback, survey them. How, how does it look? How does it sound? How does it go? If it feels comfortable, if they find it effective, how does the kid react? Uh, they can give you really valuable and precious information that we cannot get from any other source. And of course, inform parents about their kids' progress as you would do in a regular class. I'm not asking something different here. And of course, yeah, sometimes online parents' meetings as an assembly all together to discuss as a group. Now, with your students, things become really, really, uh, sorry, more active here. Um, it takes more time. We need to acknowledge this. So everything, it might be like multiplied or need double time in order to connect. And you need to spare some time so to connect individually. There might be other problems, like in your face-to-face -face classes, like difficulties, learning difficulties, psychological problems. This is a pandemic. This has never occurred in humanity before. Don't expect any person, any person to be like he or she used to be before this. It needs support. And as educators, you need to be able to provide this. Student-led tech support in case there is troubleshooting or the basics. Sometimes, again, as I said, there might be a detail. And of course, sharing. Never think that there is not enough things to do when you are online. The brain, uh, in the introduction, it, uh, it was mentioned that I'm also a neuro language coach. This is what we do as neuro language coaches. We create brain friendly environments. The first thing that we learn is that the brain loves what is real and personal. So if I'm asking you to talk to me about your talents, hobbies, interests, if the floor is always over to you, the brain gets in a friendlier mode in case there is some kind of reaction to online. So that's a nice trick. Always give them the floor. Uh, and um, of course, we should be the model. We should establish the welcome. Welcome in the, in the beginning, you know, um, is uh, the half of everything. That's what the ancient Greeks used to say. If you have a good start, a flying start, everything rolls really nice and smoothly after that. So arrive early, open the space, greet everyone by name as they join in, welcome image on display to anchor senses sometimes. And, uh, you know, um, for primary learners, I usually this like a poster and actually to tell you the truth, this is my wife, she did that, you know, she used it in one of her classes and I loved this. She isolated this part of the poster and became one of her students' favorites. Uh, just for the welcoming. And if you want some more, go and visit the National Gallery um, website. Uh, you can find different paintings for backdrops for your video calls and um, conferences. You know, this simple activity gave me like food and lesson for three entire sessions because they were really discussing the backgrounds in English. I, I allowed some personal space, some personal interest, and it, you know, help the brain feel friendlier towards the lesson because they created their own space and they put this personal touch. Um, yes, Mr. Kokolas, I just wanted to let you know that you have five more minutes. Thank you so much. Icebreakers can be, can be a part of this, a daily mood check-in or stretching out 
yes, it has to be done. Take a big breath. Like we see in yoga classes, it's necessary. It's necessary to be done. Uh, that's another nice activity which comes from the Jimmy Fallon show um, that tonight, so it's called um, uh, A Box of Lies. Um, you describe the object and the students try to guess whether you are telling the truth or not. It's really, really funny. And I have practiced it many times online and it really works when we are stuck or when we want to encourage a little bit of um, uh, speaking. And uh, in terms of more tips regarding engagement, you know, this is the constant. In the beginning, it was like an argument and a debate because many teachers were coming to me and saying, and what about tests? How are we going to examine them? Forget about this. This is a, a crisis. This is, this is a, a unique situation, as I was told, I told you before. Uh, evaluation uh, should come through assessment. It has to be more loose. So there are so many other ways. Flip classroom, that's the buzzword, and I could not encourage more of the students to do it. You give a stimuli for outside the classroom, they bring it in, you discuss it. That's an entire talk. I don't have time to elaborate more. A, a lot of feedback. You know, I have also here in, in my home, everyone has his own room. We are four people, and during the morning, we all have conferences or online lessons. So I'm listening to my daughter's uh, lesson that they're having in Greek. And sometimes, you know, I, I, I stepped in and I congratulated the teacher because she was doing constantly exactly this feedback all the time, addressing nobody, nobody was staying idle. The whole lesson was scripted and she could evaluate, um, address all the time, full of activities, alternatives, um, and it was a full energizing lesson online. The kids were really astonished by it and they were fully engaged. I have seen this, but it's all about the teacher. And of course, gamification can be a great contributor because this is the technology environment that favors this. And by giving game prizes, missions, clans, leaderboards, um, you can definitely uh, motivate them more. Presentation skills in front of the camera, I highly encourage as well. Or a task like this, choose a piece of music, draw a picture, present it to the class as well, can be like, you know, having a movie. And these are screenshots from uh, some uh, gamification tools for some, from some platforms. Simply by sending digital rewards, you motivate them. And if you are using a platform, you can get immediate access even to the scores, how many attempts. So those of you who really testing means a lot, that can be another idea. Now, um, the last slide almost for today, um, create challenging educational experiences that enrich and extend their abilities, live chats, fun through applications, storytelling, role plays, improvisations. This is another interesting um, site, Studio Ghibli, where you can get a lot of backgrounds for story storytelling. I had so many different sessions only discussing this picture and this picture and this picture. And here you can see also the lesson plan, start the story, have random students add the text line, once upon a time, select the students randomly. It can go on for at least 20 minutes and it's pure, pure engagement. This is an amazing, uh, studio Ghibli, if I'm pronouncing correctly, I think they are Korean and they have these amazing things. Or the newsroom, that's another uh, activity uh, where they can present something they think is important for sharing in the classroom. The news at six, uh, different situations uh, that you can come up. And the most important thing also, mind the gap because there might be cases where computer is not available and we should not exclude these students paper and pencil tasks and activity packs read stories do activities make a reading log write draw their own stories or comic stories work on projects pen pals can really work through email as well or even you know with simple pen and paper and update parents and students via phone calls daily. I know that there might be cases that you face this and it's not that easy, but these kids cannot be excluded just because they cannot afford to buy a computer. And this might be a way that you need to keep um, uh, and make a pass. And my last slide, which um, it's what I encourage every single kid today to do, 
And I always say, if you want to become famous and rich and make a lot of money, write a journal of this period. Make it positive. Keep a journal every day. And after five, six, ten years, from the perspective of a child, this would be a precious, precious activity. And people would like to learn how it used to be during the pandemics. You can make it an activity. And the previous time that I was presenting here, uh, John Bon Jovi, you know, I, I, I showed them a video, did this with a class in New York, and it was amazing. Talk to me about you. Talk to me about how you feel. Talk to me about you can fight this, what you can do, how you can remedy this. And a new line of lessons, engaging lessons, will, be, uh, will appear in front of you, let alone all the rest of the tips that we mentioned today. And I hope that you found useful. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, so much, Mr. Uh, Kokolas, for your very interesting presentation. It seems that everyone in the comments section uh, want to express their appreciation for your inspiring um, words. And uh, and you have you have two questions um, from Hi Hajar away. and Khadija. All right, so the first one is um, from Khadija. She said that it is known that humans are social beings. We love to interact through physical sensations. So how can we compensate this part in, in online classes for students? Well, physical sensation is even, you know, I'm going to, to say something that the first presenter that came on this earth came from this country and he was Omer. Omer didn't have a video. He didn't have a chat. He didn't have a computer. He had his harp and his voice and he was mesmerizing the people. So yeah, we still have this power of connection uh, even you know, through a different technological means. It's all about you know, the, the, the power of the teacher. If you feel it, if you know how you can do it, if you are very well prepared, this will be transmitted to the other side of the computer. And it can happen even without being, you know, face to face with a student. You can still have a connection. This is what I can guarantee after one year of teaching remotely. All you have to do is adjust your teaching to this new norm and these new devices maybe as well. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, how should parents and peers be engaged in online teaching and learning? Well, the parents are what we said before, uh, and the peers as well, with a lot of sharing, with a lot of communication, with a lot of touching base um, uh, between these uh, parts. Show your lesson to the people. Never be afraid to share. There is nothing to share or hide here. Make them part of their classroom. When they come and see what you're doing in the classroom, they're going to glorify you. You're going to be, you know, like their hero, because I think that's the great gain of this pandemic. Teachers, alongside with doctors, became in the front line of doing good. And uh, the computer opened up the class to the rest of the families, to the rest of the people to come and see, come and check what really, sometimes it's a real struggle they're doing with their own kids. And I think um, that's the only way to do, share, communicate, um, make them part of what you're doing. And engagement will come. Thank you so much again, Mr. Kokolas. Uh, your presentation was very, very inspiring and now we will move to our second speaker as my um, if i may say uh due to other commitments i need to leave the panel yes, uh, yes you may. feel free to give my email uh i will give it to you uh to anybody you know that i'm a very accessible person so anybody can find me on facebook mail so if there are any further questions i will be more than happy to answer uh, i can see now the live uh, transmission so i will put it on the facebook chat okay thank you and so much i'm so sorry for not being able to attend the rest of you good luck to the rest of the speakers and thank you so much for the invitation bye bye thank you very much mr kokolas thank you all right moving on to our second speaker ms janice uh, mccafferty right 
Um, her presentation is going to be about virtual exchange challenges and opportunities. But first, let me introduce um, Dr. McCafferty. Uh, she researches and teaches in College of Education as at um, Missouri State University in the USA. She holds a PhD in learning, teaching, and curriculum from the University of Missouri. Um, her commitment to teaching for civic engagement and global understanding has included service to public diplomacy initiatives, education associations, and international NGOs. She has also uh, had the privilege to work with uh, and learn from teachers and students in India and Morocco through multiple academic and public uh, diplomacy fellowships. So as I said earlier, her presentation is going to be about the challenges and opportunities um, in like virtual exchange. Um, and she'll tell us more about this. Uh, I give you the floor, Ms. McCafferty Wright. Thank you, Azuma, and thank you to the Global Bus Foundation and uh, the Rabat Sarabaf and to Mr. Kokolos for those fabulous ideas. Um, I should be keeping a journal, and this is something I tell myself regularly, that when somebody else says it, 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 it reminds me, yes, I should write a journal of these times. Um, fabulous ideas. So many things. I'm, I'm so uh, happy to be here. Last March, I had a grant to fund um, a research project in Morocco. Uh, and I was preparing for this. It had taken a lot of work to get the grant. And I had all my, my travel arrangements made and people lined up to interview and talk with. And then COVID changed all of my plans. Uh, and, and here I still am in Missouri. <laughs> so uh, like many of you, I've had to change the way um, I approached this past year. Uh, including how I taught my courses. The university where I work gave us about one week to change how we teach and to figure out how to use tools such as Zoom. Uh, COVID started arriving in our community right as spring break started happening. So we had spring break plus an extra bit of time uh, to work on how we would proceed for the rest of the semester. Um, during that week, I started contacting friends who are teachers in Egypt and Morocco, and I saw teachers in North Africa using WhatsApp and more uh, to manage classes of 40 students. They inspired me and they gave me courage to think of ways that I could approach my teaching when I teach the teachers at Missouri State University when we returned from the break. Um, so I developed a weekly world ed chat, a weekly world education chat on Zoom that was just going to be an option for my students uh, because many were returning to their homes uh, during the, the shutdown. And so many of them live in rural places without good internet, without good uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. So um, I started preparing some optional activities they could engage with, with if they have the technology. Uh, so we started these uh, weekly world ed chats on Zoom so that we can learn from each other and learn how teachers in other countries were uh, facing the challenges uh, that the pandemic was bringing to us. Um, and just learn about new ways of learning and teaching and, and think differently about what we were doing. So this was a terribly disruptive time. Uh, so uh, I began to think of, of distance learning, this new phrase that everybody was using, distance learning. And I began to think of the word distance within that and, and thinking about how we had many distances to unlearn. So my students were responding very well to the world ed, ed chats. And I could see that despite our situation with distance learning, we were unlearning the distances that we were taught. So when I speak of unlearning distances, um, I'm referring to the way students in the United States and everywhere else uh, have been mistaught or miseducated to think about the other through stereotypes. And teacher trainees at Missouri State University are not, not any different from those of us who have been taught stereotypes um, about the other. And so they enter their courses with people who share similar cultural backgrounds to themselves. 
So as they are becoming teachers, they are all together as a group. Most of them are white. Um, most of them are women. Many of them come from rural places. They come from families who are working class families. And many of them are uh, the first in their family to go to university. So uh, their educations in primary and secondary schools when they were small, um, it included a lot of nationalistic narratives of citizenship. Uh, your nation first, your nation is the best. All of these narratives that the children are taught, um, but maybe more here. <laughs> Um, there was an exclusion of Arab and Muslim peoples from their curriculum. And while we have the exclusion of, 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 of Muslim peoples and, and North Africa and the Middle East in their curriculum, we also have these portrayals on the media that were very negative. Um, so all kinds of stereotypes. Uh, additionally, students becoming teachers, the people becoming teachers right now were babies during 9-11. They have spent their entire lives living, learning, growing in a, a global, never-ending, uh, facilitated by the United States, war on terror. And so this impacts what they learned about the rest of the world. Um, so they've been surrounded by either two things, uh, Islamophobia or Disney's Aladdin. Aladdin. <laughs> so this shaped their perspectives and their stereotypes. And we really hoped to disrupt uh, these dangerous stereotypes uh, and to unlearn the distances that we were taught through them. So when I ask my students uh, to describe for me, give me some words. When, when I say a phrase, give me some words. So when I say uh, the Middle East and North Africa, uh, this is what my students describe. Let me share it with you. Here we go. Can you see? <laughs> they describe Aladdin or Aladdin. They describe deserts. And they think there's, you know, war, conflict, very, very violent things. And maybe they have images of, of Syria. I don't, it's like this generalized image that they get of danger, of threat. Uh, and so this is a problem if they're going to become teachers <laughs> because we need uh, them to be able to teach their students differently than they were taught. So um, I, I was thinking about this when heading into uh, the new semester and what we were doing or for the rest of the semester and then thinking ahead, like from here on out, how I need to teach the teachers differently uh, than what they were taught. So of course, uh, my, my students are going to become teachers. So if we do not correct the mistakes, they will be teaching a whole new generation the same mistakes. So um, the chats, we, the World Ed chats we met for one hour a week uh, for about eight weeks, maybe nine. Um, it was originally planned for long or for a shorter time, but people kept asking more and more, please. So I added some more and I worked beyond uh, the semester. And in addition to recruiting uh, participants, my role uh, in the World Ed chats was just to facilitate them. People would log in, uh, I would welcome them. Um, I would introduce three prompts. One would be connected to like an icebreaker, uh, their personal identities, their experiences. Um, the next prompt would be a discussion question related to education uh, and or culture. And then finally, there would be a request for the group, the small breakout room groups, to craft a statement, something that they wish to share with the large group. So I would put uh, people into breakout rooms for about half of the, the session for the World Ed Chats. Uh, and then they would return to the whole group, they would report out, and we would brainstorm possible questions for future exchanges. Uh, so uh, this uh, happened for quite some time. Let me share one of the ways that we promoted it. We used Twitter, we used Facebook. A lot of it was just contacting friends in Morocco and Egypt and saying, hey, here's the link, come and join us. But word of mouth, uh, the word got out. I met some new people, people would bring their friends um, and we would enjoy these World Ed Chats together. So 
the outcomes exceeded my expectations. 20 to 50 people participated every week. Uh, roughly half of them were teacher candidates from Missouri State University, and about half were international teacher trainees, trainors, educators, NGO workers, some countries such as Morocco, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and Jordan. 31 teacher candidates out of my 82 who were enrolled in, in the course attended at least three of the chats. Many attended one and several attended all of them, um, even though it was an optional activity. It was not required and they had many things to do for their other courses. Um, and attending the chats was not attached to uh, specific assignments. It was an option. Uh, and people just kept telling their friends about it. I would have somebody invite their cousin, invite their mother, uh, their grandmother would say hello to the group. And it was a great way to unlearn some of the, the distances we were taught and to uh, eliminate some of the fear that my students had about the rest of the world. Overwhelmingly, uh, teacher candidates reported an appreciation uh, for the mentorship that they received from veteran teachers all over the world. Teacher candidates during this time, the teacher trainees, they were very nervous because they know that they should be in classrooms, uh, getting familiar with uh, schools and students and getting practice before they begin their student teaching. Uh, and they were nervous that they were missing something and that they would fail as teachers in the future because they did not have that hands-on experience in a classroom that they knew they, they should be getting through their internships. Um, but the veteran teachers with whom they met reassured them. Uh, Falkia from Egypt reassured them, uh, if, as long as you love your students and love what you're doing, you're gonna do it well, you're going to be okay. You will figure this out and veteran teachers will be there to support you during this time. Um, other uh, guests who were with us, Marwa from Egypt, uh, told them that, that it's okay, it's easier to learn about people than you think. Uh, and learning about people is, is better than learning about governments when you're trying to learn about culture. Um, students who were expressing or who were experiencing very stressful situations in their homes uh, during this time uh, wrote that uh, these World Ed Chats were helpful uh, for them uh, in re relieving some of the stress that they experienced um, from being concerned about family members who uh, were uh, dealing with COVID or losing their jobs, uh, that, that time to connect with each other meant a lot to them. So uh, these are just some of the outcomes. Uh, my students uh, wrote many like kind thanks uh, for providing these, uh, that they, they said they made connections all over the world and it would give them something to look forward to in uncertain times. And one student wrote, I never thought quarantine would take me all over the world. Um, and that affirmed to me that this was something that should continue even after quarantine, that we need to continue uh, learning about each other during, during the, the post pandemic times. So elementary school uh, social study standards uh, where I live have been built around a very problematic framework of how we teach children about the world around them. It, the way that we teach them is called um, expanding horizons. This is what's recommended in a lot of curriculum in the United States where it focuses on the child first and then the family and then the school and then the community and then the state. And there's not a problem with this, with connecting to the child's life. The problem is that in some communities in the United States, you can expand and expand and expand and never meet people who are very different from yourself. And so we need to find a way to bring global education into this expanding horizons framework. So this is something that I'm working uh, with, uh, with my students um, so that we can expand global horizons and connect to um, our students' cultures and our students' lives uh, and the things that they bring to their education. So um, some of the things that, uh, that I encourage my students to think about is that they think they don't think of themselves as global citizens. And I'm trying to shift the ways that they think about that because um, even if they don't think of themselves as global citizens, 
or citizens of the world, they are. How they vote, how they shop, how they teach their children, this impacts the world. And so it's very important that we understand that we are global citizens, not that uh, we become global citizens. We are interacting with the world every day through our decisions so that we become responsible and ethical in that uh, matters. And so I decided that from, from now on, uh, we would have virtual exchange as part of our courses for teacher preparation. So um, with support from the Stevens Initiative Coronavirus Response Grant, uh, I spent the summer of 2020 discussing possibilities with teacher trainers and supervisors and others working at Setter Maps throughout Morocco to try and develop a program that could always be a part of our education system here in Missouri. So uh, we created a development team and with the support and expertise of Ms. Samia Wardan from Casablanca, Fatima Drifi of Agadir, Abdelatif Laklida of Marrakesh, Mohamed Lejef of La Ayoun, Mohamed Ubit of Dakhla. We had all this fabulous CETERMAF expertise to help craft a, a global exchange for teacher candidates, for teacher trainees, or for, for new teachers. So that is what we worked on. Uh, I developed a curriculum with their guidance for a virtual exchange that can be repeated with new participants every fall every spring and the curriculum is built around big questions in global education that focus on teaching strategies and resources for growing our students cultural literacies because we need to be able to read a book but also read the world right and we need to learn how to learn about other cultures so each group yes, sorry uh you i mean 15 minutes have passed and you have five to 15 minutes for Thank your presentation. You. Thank you, Asma. So each group in the virtual exchange that we have now that we've created, um, it meets for one and a half hours a week for four weeks and participants receive a certificate for their participation. And the exchange, it's a class requirement for my students because they need it <laughs> in order to become teachers in the United States. Um, I feel they need this. Uh, so it's a requirement for my students um, and it's built around their course schedules. Um, and then Moroccan participants are invited to register for the exchange as an enrichment or a professional development opportunity and earn a certificate. Um, and so uh, we started by inviting uh, people into the exchange who were connected to uh, the original development team. So the Saturn Maps that helped me develop the curriculum. So now uh, we have uh, this exchange. Occasionally uh, we promote it before it's time to uh, host a new one. Uh, people register for it. Um, and uh, we begin connecting uh, through the course. So uh, in the future, we hope to have many more people uh, become a part of our virtual exchange. Um, and we hope that it will grow. So some of the, the implications and the challenges and our plans for the future for this real fast. Some of the challenges that are that uh, we're working to include developing a better registration system for this, uh, making sure that we only register people who are likely to participate. Uh, right now, many people are interested, so they will register, but the time is not a good time for them. So it's kind of like a, yes, uh, I'm registering, inshallah. <laughs> and so, and then, and then the time doesn't work. And that's a problem not with the, the people uh, in Morocco who are registering, it's a problem with the United States not offering it at a good time for them. And so that's something that we need to look at is finding a way to uh, include as many people as possible with how we register people. Also, um, another challenge is with funding. Uh, it requires a lot of work to coordinate the exchange and it would be good to win another grant so that I can pay people who support it uh, and so that I can pay people to continue growing the program and to help us run the program. So I'm still working on, on winning a grant on that. So I, if, if I do win one, you'll know because the program will, will expand very quickly um, and many people will be invited to be a part of it. Um, and it would help us pay for guest speakers from the Moroccan education system 
who contribute to the program. Um, so a promotional budget would also be very good and uh, funding to help host uh, in-person trainings and celebrations for the participants would be nice. So I'm, I'm still working on that. <laughs> also, it would be good for United students in the United States to have more exposure to Moroccan culture before participating. What we see is that students in Morocco, or teacher trainees in Morocco, they have so much more experience engaging with other cultures. Um, and they know so much more about the United States because it's been a part of their curriculum, their NGOs that support cultural exchange for them, um, school, the media, public diplomacy programs, such as American centers and access and more. They've just been exposed to more than my students have. So I would like to eventually um, be able to host some sort of program uh, where uh, I can fund somebody here in Missouri from Morocco uh, who could help facilitate and guide a language table or a culture table, learning table, something where we could meet once a week and enjoy playing with culture and enjoy in, in a uh, fun way getting to know another culture. So that is one uh, goal that uh, I have for the program. Um, another uh, would be that um, we have something built into the program for when people are done, that they can, there's a platform for them to coordinate their own exchanges. So if I have a, a teacher trainee who becomes a teacher and they're teaching fifth grade students or fourth grade students, and there's a, a teacher of English in Morocco, uh, and they're working on similar content in some way, or there, there can be crossover, they can coordinate an, an exchange between their classes. So that's another step for the future. So uh, one unexpected thing that we have seen is that this cultural exchange, it's not just between uh, teacher trainees in the United States and Morocco. It's, it's for new and, and future teachers in Morocco to exchange with each other. Uh, for example, in sharing their cultures with US students, uh, Hassani, Amazir, uh, Ghibli students are sharing what they learn uh, with each other and they're sharing their own cultures with each other. Uh, and so I see some interesting intercultural interactions happening across Morocco between different cultures. And it shows to our students just how culturally and ethnically diverse North Africa is. So that's been a, a, a fun component uh, to learn more about Hastani culture and Amazir culture uh, through this and to watch them teach each other. <laughs> um, uh, we began by recruiting new and future Moroccan teachers uh, through the development team's classes and connections. But next year, we hope to grow the program a bit to invite future teachers of English from any center meth in Morocco. Um, and because of scheduling conflicts, not everybody will be able to participate, but we hope that everybody who wants to join will be able to either in the fall or in the spring of next year. And some years, uh, it's possible that we will even offer a summer session uh, so that it will be easier for new teachers to join with their schedules. So years from now, uh, we hope to invite other uh, US colleges of education into the exchange. It would be great, especially if we could um, partner with a historic black institution, a Hispanic uh, universities, Native American colleges. Uh, we need to bring more diversity from the United States into uh, this exchange and make sure that virtual exchange, that we take an equitable approach to access and accessing opportunities through virtual exchange. So this is where we're at right now. Uh, let's see <laughs> how the program grows, um, but I'm very excited about the work that we're doing and I'm happy to answer any questions about it. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Janice. Um, your ideas were very, very inspiring and thank you for tackling such a great topic. Uh, we are very grateful for the time and effort that you took to share your thoughts with us on this issue. Um, the audience was actually very, very interested uh, as well. Uh, many people were talking, especially about the, four, the first point that you tackled, which is Orientalism. The idea yeah. of how, um, I mean, Westerners think about the Middle East as always sometimes primitive and or savage or uh, something like that. 
And uh, yes, we do have to change the stereotypical ideas from our students' minds. Uh, some of the questions um, were as the following. Uh, so the first one is, what, what was your reaction or feedback uh, after, I mean, to correct or evaluate the stereotypical knowledge your students manifested? What, yeah. were your feed, what was your feedback after so, getting their ideas about the Middle East? Yeah, so one thing we, we often focus on in education is meeting them where they are at and acknowledging that you have been taught to have a lot of fear about a place you know nothing about. Like, how does that feel, <laughs> you know? And they would they would start there, you know, like, oh, I think I've been taught some things that are incorrect and I want to change this, I don't know how. Like, well, let's start by meeting people. Um, and it would, it would focus on that. Um, so uh, I would have students, uh, before our exchange uh, this, this spring, I had students write a reflection before the exchange. What are some words that you associate with North Africa, with Islam, with the Middle East? And, and they wrote those and I responded uh, to them. And often in their reflection, they would write, okay, so this is what I've, what I've been exposed to, but I know that it's not correct. Like they could see that it's not correct, but they didn't know what the correction was. They just knew that chances are good. It can't all be, can't all be true. And they wanted to learn more. So our students are very intellectually curious. They've just been miseducated. So yeah, exactly. Uh, they do want and to learn. And even our so students uh, who yeah. are like part of the, I mean, African continent and they, they do have some self-orientalism and they do think of themselves as sometimes primitive in relation to, or mm -hmm. uh, I mean, com in comparison to uh, the Western culture, for example. Yes, and during the exchange, one of the questions that it's, a, the, the exchange is organized now around some big questions. And uh, one of the questions that I ask students, uh, new and future teachers to think about is what are the stereotypes that you think people have about your own culture? So if you are in Missouri State University, what are some stereotypes that you suspect the world has about you? And if you are you know, in Morocco, what are some stereotypes that you suspect the world has about you? And they share these with each other. And then a next step in this progression is find some resources from your own culture that a teacher in a different culture could use to teach about you, about your life, you know, uh, to teach about a life in the United States that does not happen in New York City, uh, that, that does not involve having a bunch of wealth, you know, um, and students share what it's like to, you know, live on a farm in the United States or you know, to live in a smaller town or a smaller community in, in the United States. So, yes, it's been very fruitful. Exactly. Yes, so uh, moving on to the second question, because we don't have uh, much more time. Uh, it's really the, uh, I mean, the, the audience said it's really challenging when you try to correct some false stereotypes while media promotes them. So can we say that the educational system failed to create what we call a critical thinker? What do you think about this? I think that is absolutely correct. Um, the, the people who are teaching, they were mistaught, they were taught incorrect things or not taught anything at all. And the media filled that. And I tell my students, don't, don't blame your teachers necessarily. They are teaching what they were taught by people who were teaching what they were taught by people who were teaching what they were taught. So these kinds of errors, these kinds of stereotypes and mistakes, uh, they, they happen. Um, and the best we can do is to, to fix from where we are at. So uh, to focus on making sure that our students think differently about the world, or at least question when they hear things that, that probably aren't true, you know. Yeah, media literacy and I mean, any kind of literacy is very, very necessary in our educational system. Thank you so much, Miss Janice. Um, I mean, we still have some questions, but we don't have much time. For them but i would like to thank you very very much for your uh talk and your presentation it was amazing 
And now I guess we'll move to our next speaker. Uh, Najwa, can you please introduce our next speaker? Hi again, of course, Esma. Thank you for moderating the first half of this webinar. And thank you, Mrs. Janice and Mr. Uh, Kukulas. Um, you have been like sharing some interesting ideas and I'm pretty sure our audience or our prospective teachers who are watching the live stream on Facebook, I'm sure they'll a great deal from your experience. Um, so now we are going to move to our next presenter from Morocco. Mr. Jamal Dinslimani, are you with us? So um, I'm going to introduce him to our audience. So Mr. Jamal Dinslimani is currently an associate professor, an English yeah, teacher trainer. All right. All right, Mr. Jamal. Um, so uh, Dr. Jamal Din Slimani is currently an associate professor. He's also an English teacher trainer and department head at the regional center from, uh, for the professions of education and training in Rabat, Morocco. He earned his doctorate in alternative and augmentative communication from Hassan II University in Mohammedia, Morocco. Mr. Slimani graduated from Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania with a master's degree in speech and human communication studies. He has presented several papers at MATE, Moroccan Association in Teachers of English, annual conferences on topics such as fostering students, fostering students' critical thinking skills, process writing, action research, and teachers' perceptions of students with disabilities. He has also given dozens of workshops for English teachers on online collaborative projects and for teachers of other subjects on the use of ICT in teaching. Professor Slimani has been a member of Moroccan Education and Re Resource Network um, since 2004 and of International Education and Resource Network since 2003. He has presented papers at the latter several annual conferences in Egypt, Morocco, Canada, and Qatar. He has also co-facilitated um, several online courses under the Stevens Virtual Exchange Initiative and the Bridge Program. So far, four of Dr. Stimani's articles have been published, three of them, three of them in Morocco and one in USA. The themes of his articles revolve around online collaborative projects, assessment of 21st century skills, disability, and symbolic violence. Mr. Slimani, your biography is very inspiring. You've got an amazing career. So um, in his presentation, Mr. Slimani raises an interesting question, which, which is, are our CR, CRMF graduates ready to, um, to teach students with disabilities? So he's going to argue for the inclusion of the module of disability in the training of future teachers, because when the latter become fully fledged teachers, they are usually at a loss as to how to deal with students with disabilities. Often the immediate reaction of those teachers is to ignore them or at best treat them with pity, which may reinforce the idea that students with disabilities are just a burden on the school as well as on society at large. So without any further delay, I pass the floor to Mr. Jamal Simani. The floor is yours, Dr. Simani. Thank you very much, Najwa. Thank you. You're welcome, you're very welcome. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right. <clears throat> All right, this is the outline of my presentation. I will start with an introduction, then we'll talk about attitudes um, of people in general toward people with disabilities. And then we will talk about the experiences of our CERMET trainees uh, with disability. Um, 
And here I refer to the CERMED trainees. Uh, by the way, for our, for our foreign guests, um, maybe if they don't know what CERMED stands for, it stands, it's a, basically a regional training, teacher training center. Uh, we teach uh, trainees for one year, and then when they graduate, they are ready uh, to take classes and to be um, official teachers. And um, I asked uh, CERMED trainees from Rabat and from Agadir about their experience with disability, which I will tell you about in a few minutes. And then uh, we'll move on to the trainees' attitudes toward potential students with disabilities. The question was, what if you had a student with a disability in your class? What would you do? And then we'll move on to some recommendations for uh, teachers and for training programs, and then conclusion. Now, to give you some like background information, um, as many of you um, know, um, there are over 1 billion uh, of people with disabilities uh, across the globe. Um, the, the, this, this, uh, this, this figure was given by the United Nations uh, in the census of 2014. In Morocco, there are about 2 million people with disabilities, uh, which is about 6.8% of the population. And this, of course, figure also was given by, was, I retrieved this, or I got this from the website of the uh, Ministry of Solidarity, Women, Family, and Social Development. Um, as you can see, 6.8% um, um, is, is not a small number. Um, it, and also in, um, uh, let me see if I can get the screen this way, because yes, and 15% all across the world uh, is not also a small number. And actually, a lot of people say that um, uh, people with disabilities are probably the biggest minorities uh, in each society. So it's a minority, but it's the biggest minority. And of course, if we have this number, it means that the chances are that we'll have some students with disabilities in our classes. Okay, now attitudes uh, toward people with disabilities. Once upon a time, in the past, students with uh, people with disabilities in general were seen as a curse of God, possessed by demons, pitiable creatures, and utterly miserable. So you can see how negative, you know, the the attitudes were, and how negative the the, the phrases or the words uh, that were used to describe them. And the, these people, uh, people with disabilities, were. Um, isolated in asylums or in arms houses, along with the criminal and the poor. So their 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 situation was really a very very bad one uh, in the past. But today, did the, did the situation change? Yes, yes, it did. But it is far from being felicitous. Um, today, some even there are some people who still think that people with disabilities have different personality traits. They have different moral characteristics and they have different social abilities. And um, uh, one, one, of the, one of the scholars um, who specializes in um, disability says, uh, said no further research is needed to show that it is socially disadvantageous to be physically handicapped in initial social encounters. The disadvantage is powerful and pervasive. And, and it reflects um, a, a lot, a lot of this really true, um, at least as far as Morocco is concerned, a lot of people see that uh, whoever is disabled or whoever has a disability is not like normal, quote unquote. Now, why, why did we end up um, in many societies, including Morocco, why did we end up having those, those negative attitudes toward people with disabilities? Um, what, what is the origin or what are the origins of those attitudes? There are several. Number one is what we call social cultural conditioning. Um, basically, it means um, that our society sometimes teaches how to look at certain people. It teaches about our culture, it teaches about many things and, uh, and teaches how, how, to, how to look at, uh, for example, the physical appearance of people. And, and then as, as a lot of people know, many societies put a lot of emphasis on physical integrity. They put a lot of emphasis on personal appearance. And, and uh, today, uh, many of you will, will, will agree with me, 
about the fact that some people are so obsessed with their appearance that they have resorted and they are still resorting to aesthetic surgery. Some people have like radically changed their faces. Some people have changed their teeth. Some people have changed their cheeks. And then you can imagine, you know, other parts of the body. Why? Because they want to look beautiful and for women. And then of course, for men, men also go for, for, for surgery because they want also, you know, they have also other person they want to look um, more, more handsome and maybe they want to have more muscles, et cetera, et cetera. So, so a lot, a lot, of, a lot of, of focus or emphasis is put on the physical appearance of people. Now you can imagine when somebody has a disability, that's, that's exactly the opposite of what people want. Now, uh, how do we get those? So, I mean, how do we get conditioned? Is we get conditions through what we call agencies of socialization. There are so many, but um, what, what most scholars talk about is family, like in chronological order, then school, peers, particularly at the age of puberty, you know, between 12 and 10, 20. Uh, the, the, the influence of the peers is, of course, so significant. Then, of course, religion, it teaches you about your culture, it teaches you about what you do, what you should do, what you should not do, and the mass media. And of course, today we include, of course, social media. And to me, the mass media is probably the biggest monster uh, in, in this socialization. Why? Because the mass media teaches people things or puts the focus or the emphasis on things that um, sometimes are not reasonable. Again, I go back to the idea of, of like, uh, just think about advertisement, go back to the idea of the beautiful body. Just think about the advertisement, the commercial that we see on, on a daily basis. Think about like sh shampoo, if they want to sell shampoo, what kind of woman or man do they show you? Probably the most beautiful woman, the most handsome man. Uh, or also uh, think about, um, uh, th think about um, actresses and actors. If you are very beautiful and a good actress, you have a lot of chances to be, um, you know, the the, hero, the heroine or the hero in any movie, and you can even get an Oscar. So, so whereas when if you are you are not good looking, you might always get you you, you will never get, usually you will never get a a first role. You will get a second role in a movie, or uh, if if you are not if you are not good looking, you may not become a famous act uh, singer. Um, and so on and so on. So a lot of a lot of focus and a lot of importance is given to the appearance, and the mass media are contributing to this, uh, particularly TV and then cinema, and then and then and of course today it's also social man, uh, um, social media. Then uh, the other the uh, another um, origin of negative attitudes it's what we call psychodynamic factors, like like mourning. Mourning means that. When people see a person with a disability, they think that this person should feel sad all the time. Why? Because this person has lost something like a part of a body or is not quote unquote normal. So they always, they always expect the person with a disability to look unhappy. And if the person looks happy and jovial and uh, you know, happy with their life, they, they see this as a big contradiction. And here I just like invite you um, to think about, have you ever seen like, you know, have you ever been in a place where you have seen a person with a disability, for example, dancing? A lot of people would think, what is that person doing? That person should be sitting in a, uh, in a wheelchair and just looking at people. So they think, they think fun and, you know, and then dancing is only for quote unquote normal people not for people with disabilities. So they think that the person with a disability should all, always be sad, should always look unhappy. Why? Because they have a disability. Then the other factor is called the halo effect or the spread phenomenon. This means uh, that some people, when they see a disability in a person, particularly a visible disability, they think that that person is, the, is, is disabled from head to toe. A person might have just maybe one problem. Maybe a person maybe cannot walk or a person maybe has got like speech, uh, speech problem, the person that cannot speak properly. They think that, that that person is sick from head to toe. So they like it's, they spread everything like on the, on the person and they think that the person is sick um, every, everywhere in the body. 
And, and, um, and of course here, I would like to give you an example that happened to me just like recently about um, a few months ago. I was, I, was in, I was in hospital, I had anemia and I was hospitalized for um, a few days and I had to go uh, to, go to have a gastroscopy. So I had to see the specialist in gastroscopy. I mean, she, she, she's a doctor and she's a specialist, of course. Uh, and then uh, she, um, so, uh, so the nurse, the nurse pushed me on my wheelchair, pushed me to the, to their office. And then um, as I went in, into the office, I want, I had to get on that table, you know, that table is a little bit higher above the ground. And then I couldn't get on that table. So I had somebody to carry me and to put me on the table so that she could, you know, have the uh, gastroscopy. And um, when she saw all that, she thought that I was completely disabled. And, you know, she asked me, can you speak? So she even thought that I, I was like mute, that I could not speak. And I was just like shocked. And I said, you know, I am a teacher trainer. That was my, my response. Then the other fact, the other origin is um, anxiety provoking unstructured situations. So what is an unstructured situation is um, in, in our daily life, there are some situations in which we know how to act and how to react. We know what to say, you know what to do. But a lot of people, when they meet a person with a disability, for them, it's vague. They don't know what to do. The situation is unstructured. And this provokes anxiety in them. So what they do, very often they just avoid talking to the person. Some people, for example, say, well, I would like to ask him or her how she got you know, that disability, but I, I was, I'm, I'm worried that she or he might be um, you know, offended. So, so I would just rather not talk to them and they just go away. Uh, aesthetic aversion is another um, origin of negative attitudes. It's um, when, when sometimes when people see a person you know, uh, who has, for example, a, an amputation, or maybe who has, like, can't walk or doesn't have like uh, any of the, of the, any leg, and then um, they see this as ugly, an ugly sight. Uh, there is also another example of people who have cerebral palsy. Um, cerebral palsy is, you know, it's a disease that some people have when uh, before, before, immediately before they are born or while they are born or a few years after they are born is that the brain does not get enough oxygen. And then of course it has an impact on their motor skills on uh, also on their speaking skills. Uh, this, this speaking ability, they can't speak, they can't even swallow, uh, you know, food. So they, and sometimes they have like a distorted mouth. So when people see them, they, it's like they say, oh, that's disgusting. Oh, that's ugly. And they just like avoid that. They don't want to talk to them. The last one is called a uh, minority group comparability. Um, as we have, as I have said at the beginning of the presentation, the um, people with disabilities are considered a minority and they are treated as other minorities are treated. Think about, think about like a country and in that country, there is a minority. It could be a religious minority. It could be um, a racial minority. Usually minorities are treated by the majority are not treated very, very fairly, are not treated very well. So it's the, the same thing. So when, when, it, when it, we compare those racial minorities or religious minorities, the way they are treated is the same is the same that happens to people with disabilities because they are a minority. So the majority uh, does not treat them uh, very well. So they, 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 they are victims of discrimination and of isolation, et cetera. Now, now we come to our um, trainees experiences with disability. I, I gave them a questionnaire uh, with, with a few questions just to see what they know and what they don't know about disability and how they, 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 they would react if they had a student uh, who has a disability in their classes. So as you can see, the number is uh, 150 responses, 57.3 are male and then 42.7 are, are female. And as I told you also at the beginning, uh, the uh, trainees are from the training center of Rabat here, and then also from Agadir. I, I wanted to have like different perspective or to see whether the geographical difference, um, you know, has any, any, any impact on the, um, um, experiences of trainees with disability. So the next question was, do you personally know or have known someone with disability? Um, um, as you can see, the majority said yes. 
okay? And of course, this was expected because, you know, um, there are so many, we have like, a, we can have a parent, you can have an uncle, we can have a cousin. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, when I said, if the answer is, is yes, uh, is the person or was the person a family member, a neighbor, a classmate, etc. So let's just look at the, uh, the, the, um, the biggest like figures is a uh, 39.2 say it's a family mem uh, member and then 32% uh, say it's a neighbor and then 33.6 say it's a classmate. So, um, so it means it seems that people have at least like they know at least someone or um, either, either uh, somebody close to the family or somebody who is a neighbor or somebody who is just an acquaintance as it says here in the, in the graph. Now, the question, next question was, does or did the person have a physical disability, a mental disability, a hearing disability, or a speech disability, or a visual disability? As you can see, the biggest uh, number goes for physical disability, then comes mental, and then visual. Now, the direct question was, how much do you know about the, uh, that disability, the one that, you know, that they, uh, the disability of the person that they know. So how much do they know about it? Because you can, you can see the disability, but how much do you know about it? I thought this was an interesting question because um, if the more, the, more, uh, tr the more trainees know, the easier their task might be as a teacher when, uh, if they ever have a student with a disability. So if you, can, if you look at the, the, um, the percentages, if we take a little with hardly anything, with nothing, then we get something like, um, 80, 80, something almost 80%, okay? Because 15.9 uh, say a lot and 65.9 say a little, 12.9 say hardly anything and then 6.1 say nothing. So if you get all that like nothing, hardly anything, that's already uh, 20, about 20%. And then if you add a little, that's um, about uh, 85%. So it's, it's, it's a lot. So our, our trainees, they do need to uh, know or to learn about disability and to have some information about disability. So next question was, if you had a student with disability, would you treat him or her like his classmates or treat him or her with pity or just ignore him or her, et cetera, et cetera. So the, um, the most important answers were, um, the most frequent answers were like 86 for treat him uh, like his or her classmate, which is good. So it showed that, that our trainees have this sense of fairness towards their students. And then, but 46.7, they say treat him or her with pity. And that's something, that's something we have to maybe to, to disagree with because people with disabilities in general and students of course with disabilities would not like to be treated with pity because when you treat them with pity, you overlook Many of, their, many of their capacities. And last question, uh, last question probably, after you graduate from the CRMF, do you think we know how to deal with students with disabilities? So 33.3 say yes, 9.3 say no, but those who are not sure are 55.3. And that's, that's uh, again, um, consolidates the opinion or the idea that our, our trainees do need to know how to deal with disability, with students with disabilities. Uh, Professor, Professor Slimani, sorry for interrupting. I just want to remind you that you have five to seven minutes left maximum. Thank you very much. I will try to make it five. Welcome. All right, so, so what are the recommendations we should, um, I could make for, the, uh, for our trainees? It's a, there should be a training package, of course, and it should include a module on disability. Um, um, and this is like, this is a, um, um, a sine qua non condition for any uh, teacher trainee who wants to graduate from, from the center because they have to know how to deal with students with disabilities because they will surely have one, one, I mean, they will have it like other, if they don't have it next year, they will have it the year after, it's, but but they they are bound to have someone that has a disability because their number is growing of course and because the Ministry of Education is encouraging students with disabilities to go to school. Uh, also, I recommend guidebooks. But actually, you know what? 
uh, I found out by visiting the website of the Minister of Education that there are some guidebooks there. And, and actually there are guidebooks for teachers, for principal, school principals, and even for parents. So those who are interested, they can go to the website and then we'll find them in French and in Arabic. But guess what? I mean, when you read them, you would think you are on another planet, not in Morocco. Because what they say has got nothing to do with the reality in the classroom. I have, I have asked so many of my ex-trainees, now they have, they have been teaching for three years, and I, ask, I have asked them this question. Have you heard of, or have you been given a manual on how to, how to, how to deal with students with disabilities. I have asked at least 60 of my ex-trainees and the answer was no. So I don't get it. The manuals are there, the guidebooks are there and they've been there since 19, since 2015, but nobody knows about, about them. Go figure. Uh, so um, in service training, yes, so uh, our supervisors, English supervisors should also take part in training, um, in, in doing, having in-service training sessions with um, the teachers so that they can tell them about the issue of how to deal with students with disabilities. And of course, um, from time to time, some uh, experts should be invited, like speech therapists, physical therapists, they will always give some good advice to uh, the teachers who have students with disabilities and even those who don't because everybody should know so that whenever they have a student in their class they, they they know they will be ready and they will know how to deal with the students and of course parental involvement also also is necessary because parents also can be a very good source of information for the teacher because parents they are because they know the disability they know how to how to deal with the uh, uh, even the way the way a student should sit, even the way I mean, what what they what the students should can eat or cannot eat, what uh, uh, how many, how often uh, does the student need to go to the toilet, etc. So parents can be um, a very good source for teachers, and of course the school staff also should be trained. Um, you know, the administrative staff should be trained on how uh, to deal with students with disabilities, and of course maybe if the other also. Um, stakeholders or decision makers are important. Of course, they also should be part of the program. I'm done. And these are my references. Thank you, Mr. Simeni. Thank you so much. You have addressed a very sensitive issue. Some have no idea how to deal with students with special needs, especially in our nowadays society. Um, the audience were interacting with you in the comment sections. Some of them said that um, they are thankful that you have talked about this topic since, uh, like, for example, Ilham said, thank you for bringing this topic to the surface, sir. Personally, I don't have any experience with people with disabilities. So uh, we, have an, we have a question from uh, Mr. Mbarak Ahilal. He said that, do you think that we need or we should set up institutions for people with special needs, or we just like integrate them in the so-called normal. Um, it depends. It depends on the disability. If the disability is very serious, like mental disabilities, for example, it would be um, nonsensical to integrate to try to integrate somebody with a severe mental disability in a normal class, quote unquote. Uh, those normally, and I know this from experience, they usually go to a special center where they are taken care of by people who, um, you know, are, are experts in special education. Exactly. Uh, integration Mr. Simeni, in Morocco. Depends. Yeah, integrate in Morocco. They, they, now that the, today the Ministry of Education is talking about inclusive education, and it's usually for students who have a mild disability who can easily integrate a normal class. And they can, and of course, they don't have any mental uh, disability. I mean, they can, they can, they can learn. They can, they can have good marks like anybody else. Exactly, Mr. Stimani. It depends on the seriousness of uh, of the disability of students, as you said. Yes. Sure. Um, I will. I will. We will have another um, question before we move to our next presenter. So uh, the question. 
Do you think that treating them with pity would be a good idea? It would be a bad idea if they are not good at the subject, because sometimes, um, you know, like I say, if if they have any problem with their men with their mental capabilities, if they are like um, you know like everybody else, then of course we should um, we should require that they work hard as hard as anybody. However, we should think about accommodating them. Like, like I know some teachers, for example, I know for my PhD, I was, I was uh, with a student, she had, she had cerebral palsy and she could not, of course, speak and she could not write. And she had some teachers, um, I remember it was somebody, a history geography teacher who was uh, always um, requiring her, requesting her to write as fast as the others, which she could never do. So you have to accommodate the students with a disability so, but if his mental capacities are like, you know, like the other capacities of normal students, then of course we should insist that 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 she or he work uh, as hard as um, anybody else, because You're... pity would not pity would not would not would not yield any any knowledge to the students, would not make the students more knowledgeable, would not make the students better. You are absolutely right, you, Dr. Slimani. Um, so we have another more question before we move on. So uh, the question is from Ihsan Bumha. She said, uh, do you advise as teachers to favor students with disabilities? No, I, I mean, I don't like the word favor. Um, that's why I was happy with the answers of uh, the trainees when they said uh, treat like everybody else. I think what the majority said, treat everybody fairly. Um, it, it just it's not about favor, but it's about accommodating for example usually if a student has a wheelchair he, he or she should be at the front of the classroom not at the back that that's one thing if for example a student has problems like looking at the board for example he can't see or she can't see what's written on the board she should be put somewhere in the middle at the front so that's accommodating uh, if a student needs a bigger table we have to get to get him or her a bigger table so that, that's, that's what, this is not favoring, this is just accommodating the students. But when you favor, you know, the other students will not, will not like it. That's how I say it, that's my opinion. Exactly, exactly. They should be treated with a not pity. Exactly, right. Mr. Stine. Thank just, you so yeah, much here, for the insightful uh, presentation. Jezua, Jezua, yes. I would like just to share something, please. Very yes, cool, go please. ahead. Because, because it's, it's, a, it's a student I will never forget. I had her when I was a high school teacher. I had some, it was like in 1992, I think. Uh, she didn't have any arms at all, no arms. Can you imagine? So she would come with, with the, you know, she was just like little, like little butts, like pieces coming out of her shoulder, one on the left, one on the right. They were just enough for her to hold her school back, to put her school back on the back. And she would come every day and she would always be punctual. And you know, when she writes, she writes with her feet. And my God, her, I should say not handwriting, but feet writing was wonderful. She was even using a ruler to underline, you know, words. And then her copy was so beautiful to read. So, and she was never treated like, um, you know, there were no favors but just accommodation, she would need a small table where like on, on the small table, like on the floor, about 20 centimeters above the floor. And then she would put her feet on that sm small stool or table, and that would allow her to write because she can't put her feet on the desk like everybody else. So she had her feet has to be a little bit down. So, so we made sure every, all, all that was, you know, like she, at, at the beginning of every session, she would have a little table for her, her, her pens, her ruler, and then she was ready to, to, to write. So th that's, so I will never forget that she Amazing. didn't. Amazing. She got her BA in English. Wow, wonderful. You know, the story you have just shared with us, it's really inspiring and it shows how we should include um, students with abilities in our, like, um, we should include them. We should not like treat them 
pity or like exclude them from our additional interests. And Mr. Slimani, thank you for the insightful, thank you for, the, for inspiring us. Thank you for um, raising the awareness among our prospective teachers. Thank you so much. And now we move to our next speakers from Poland. Thank you, Mr. Zeman. Now we move to our next speakers from Poland, Mrs. Joanna Jamroziak. And I don't know whether I pronounced your, your name, I your pardon. She's a Polish educator. She is an ASL teacher and a teacher trainer since 1993. And also she's a manager of a private English center. So with all this experience and all these years of teaching, she's going to talk to us today about the most common mistakes in teaching vocabulary. In her presentation, she's going to talk to us about the most challenging tasks many teachers face regardless of their experience in teaching vocabulary, whether online or face-to-face. -face. So she will shed lights on the most common mistakes and she will suggest some possible solutions or methods to avoid making them. So, Mrs. Joanna, are you with us? Yes, please activate your mic. Very sorry, yes. I am very sorry. Yes, Thank right. you very much. Hi. Inviting me to Mrs. this. Joanna. Really, I feel honored to be here with you and to listen to so many wonderful speakers and uh, to be able to um, you know, hopefully to inspire some prospective teachers to become excellent teachers. Um, um, I think we have one of the most important jobs in the world because the way we teach students uh, is going to affect uh, their entire lives and the way they uh, interact with other people and use their knowledge and so on. So, okay, but back to what I'm going to, uh, to talk about. Uh, um, I have prepared a short list of the most common mistakes English teachers make, including myself. Please do not think that uh, there is anyone who uh, makes no mistakes regardless of the fact whether we are uh, English native speakers or not, everybody um, is bound to make some mistakes at some point. Uh, whether it's pronunciation mistake or grammar mistake. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't try to be uh, perfect all the time because if we uh, do, we will get disappointed and frustrated at some point. But uh, okay, I want to share my screen with you now um, to show you, hold on, please. Okay. Um, all right, hopefully it's going to work. Uh, what can you see? Yes, we can. Okay, so, uh -oh. Make sure, okay. All right. So I don't know where to put you. Okay, so I, 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 I'm sorry. I am very sorry. I oh, okay. So where is number one? Okay. No worries. No, okay. Let me start again. Um, I, I'm sorry. Okay, let me try again. Yes, take your time. Okay. That's absolutely, so, okay. Uh, one of the most basic things that a lot of teachers underestimate is the collaboration between teachers, students, and parents. Uh, first of all, we should uh, know that uh, we should establish a good rapport between, you know, uh, between teachers, between us and the parents. Because if parents are not aware how hard our work is, how many efforts we make every day to teach their children, they simply may uh, underestimate our role. And parents need to know 
that we um, try um, so many different ways to reach their children to, um, you know, to become very effective teachers, uh, to help their children enjoy uh, the way we teach. Um, parents um, are also unaware how much effort it takes for their children to learn a language. And they may not know that their children should um, do many things in order to uh, become proficient speakers. So this is uh, one thing. We need to make sure that we collaborate with uh, our students, but also with their parents. Um, Okay, and now uh, to the uh, most common mistakes we make as teachers. First of all, uh, a lot of teachers um, are not always super successful when it comes to encouraging their, their teacher, excuse me, their students to want to learn. Um, let me give you an example. You can tell your students, okay, today we are going to learn new vocabulary, uh, which I am sure is going to help you uh, learn more and so on. Okay, it's not going to work. I think as teachers, we should be more um, active and show some enthusiasm. And instead of saying, okay, we are going to learn more vocab, we can say, hi guys, we are going to do some cool stuff today. We are going to learn really great and I'm sure you are going to like it. And I think um, this enthusiasm or encouragement applies to everything we teach, grammar, but uh, uh, listening, vocabulary, but especially vocabulary, because this is something complicated. And um, I believe uh, teaching vocab is one of the most important tasks. Uh, but okay, it's a different topic. Okay. Um, another thing is, okay, the question is, does teaching a lot of vocabulary? Excuse me, I don't know why this, uh, because I guess you can say, oh my goodness again, I'm sorry. Ay, ay, ay. No problem, Ms. Anna, just I, take your time. Okay, does teaching, I, I'm sure you can see this blue, but please move this window, but okay. Does teaching a lot of vocabulary mean effective it teaching? It takes away her. Okay, so I believe teaching a lot of vocabulary is not effective at all. We cannot overwhelm our students with a lot of words in one class. Um, even if we have the best materials, even if we um, have lots of interesting aids if there is too much vocab it's not going to work um another thing is we should not try to teach a lot of new content each class um if we have for example five if a student has five english classes a week and we want to teach um 20 new words in each class it's not going to work because it means a student is supposed to learn 100 new words a week that's a lot um i don't think we should uh try to to do it it's not going to work because um either the students will not remember the pronunciation or the meaning uh so i think we need to decide uh, before classes, what we what our aim is, uh, whether uh, the vocab we are going to teach is interesting. That's that's uh, important, because um, okay. Let me show another thing. Okay, um, this is okay. Maybe let's follow the the order I have here. Uh, one of a very common mistake is we expect students to figure out words, the meaning of the words from context. And it takes a lot of time. Um, 
I do not have a lot of classes with each group, so I need to be very precise and I need to make sure that uh, my students learn a lot in the class. Um, so I do not want to waste time using some techniques that are not very uh, efficient. So uh, instead of having students figure out uh, the meaning of the word from the context, I believe it's better to, give, to provide them with definitions. Um, of course, the definitions have to be adjusted to the student's level and their proficiency in the language. Um, another thing that we may uh, do wrong is that we only have students write the word in a sentence. We cannot teach vocabulary in this way because look at this sentence here. Tina is a patient girl. If uh, we write such a sentence on the board, um, the students, the students, we uh, do not know the meaning of the word patient anyway. So um, it doesn't work this way. We need to provide uh, sentences, yes, but sentences in which um, they see the meaning of the word. Um, so instead of saying Tina is a patient girl, it would be better to say Tina does not often get upset when somebody does not follow her um, uh, request. And in this way, she displays a lot of patience. So uh, we can also uh, introduce um, words that derive from the word patient or um, in, in, in this way, uh, the students learn also what we call kind of family of words. So it's very good to teach them uh, synonyms and similar words. So like uh, we have here, Tina is a patient girl. We can also teach Tina uh, shows a lot of patience. Um, so it's really important not to expect our students to write sentences with the words we teach them. The sentences need to be clear and the students need to know exactly what the words mean. Um, we can give them context, we can give them uh, short examples, but giving a simple sentence like this does not work. Um, another thing we often um, fail to do is we teach, we do not teach the correct pronunciation. And this is very, very important. A lot of teachers feel satisfied when their students understand their questions and can answer the questions. And we do not pay enough attention to the way they pronounce uh, the words. I believe this is wrong because you know, you are all aware of the fact that in English and in many languages, there are a lot of differences when it comes to the meaning of the words, depending on the pronunciation. Uh, so when we do not teach um, the correct pronunciation of the words, um, students may not be aware that the words they are not learning are not what they are expect to know. Like uh, a lot of us know uh, the difference between uh, words like peel and pill uh, or mill and meal. Um, if we do not pay attention to the way our students pronounce the words, then um, they are going to be confused. Um, another thing um, that we sometimes do wrong is we do not have 
students repeat the words we teach them many times in uh, a class. So lack of repetition is a problem. We uh, cannot uh, expose students only because exposing um, students to the new vocab does not mean effective teaching. So students need to hear uh, the words and need to repeat them. Uh, it's not only the teacher who should repeat the words. Uh, the teacher um, displays the pronu pronunciation and makes sure the students hear everything very well, but students should be able to say the words out loud and it's best if it's not chorally because when there are 20 or 30 students in a class, you cannot be sure that your students pronounce the words correctly. Uh, so lack of repetition is a problem. Um, another very uh, important thing is that a lot of teachers do not seem to think that lack of review of the vocabulary is a problem. To me, um, it's been always important to give my students a lot of vocabulary review. Sometimes um, I give them, for example, I tell them, okay, uh, next class, we are going to review the vocabulary that we have learned in the last two weeks. So they know what exactly they are um, expected to review at home and in a class, I give them a number of activities. It can be listening, it can be, um, I don't know, doing crossword puzzles, it can be filling in gaps or matching definitions. But I think it's very important to slow down with teaching new vocab, uh, but to make sure that we go back to the vocabulary that we taught two weeks ago, or a month ago, or two months ago, because uh, you might have noticed that um, when we teach vocabulary, our students, uh, now we have March, may not remember the vocab that we taught them in September. Of course, they will remember some, but not everything. However, I think it's um, the reason maybe that we do not have them review the vocabulary enough. Um, so it's really important to teach new vocab, but we cannot forget about having them review the old stuff that they have learned so far. Um, so I would, I would uh, um, underline the importance of reviewing um, every, I don't know, you, everybody can think of the system, they review the vocab with the students. It's, uh, I, okay, I gave you my example, how I do it. I do it like once a month or every six weeks, but I think it's up to every individual teacher to find a way they uh, want to do it with their students. Another thing um, which is, a, uh, I think, important is we need to avoid uh, using boring aids. If our students are not interested in a certain subject, um, it doesn't mean we cannot teach it because we have a certain curriculum that we need to follow. However, maybe instead of giving them a listening task, uh, we can produce a photo and have students um, tell you what they see. And of course, they will not know every word that they are supposed to use to describe the picture. So we can um, help them by introducing the vocabulary. And when our photos, when our teaching aids, uh, when our pictures 
are interesting, I'm sure that the students will be more involved in the classes. Um, and um, Ms. Joanna, sorry to interrupt. You have five minutes left. Okay, yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And the last thing um, is uh, homework timelines. Uh, what, are, what do I mean by this? A lot of teachers assign some homework. Uh, for example, your students have a class on Monday and the next class is on Thursday. If you assign homework, please do your homework uh, for Thursday. You can be sure that your students um, are going to do your homework on Wednesday night. So I think it's important to have students send you some homework on Monday or Tuesday. So you can say, um, instead of saying, I mean, instead of saying, please do it for Thursday, you can uh, have them send you stuff by Thursday so that they have to do something in between Monday and Thursday. Otherwise, when they do it on Wednesday night, they will have forgotten most of the stuff that you taught them on Monday. So I think this is, this is very important that we give them deadlines when they are supposed to send stuff. It can be, you know, what you are going to give them. Um, it's up to you whether it's a listening activity that they have to fill in at home or um, filling in some gaps. Um, it's, it's completely up to you, but they need to know that they should do some work between your classes. Otherwise, um, they will not remember a lot of vocab that you tried so hard to teach them. So uh, the things that I have mentioned are just uh, very few of many things that may go possibly wrong while we teach our students vocabulary. Um, there are other things, but we are not able to cover everything in one short session. So I think that's all that I have want, that I wanted to, to say today uh, about the mistakes we make um, subconsciously, because of course we always try, I believe we always try to do our best to be effective teachers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Joanna. The audience liked your topic for it is crucial to language teaching. Some said that we must take as our intrinsic vision, use them to encourage ourselves and our knowledge improvement, of course. So thank you for the insightful presentation. Uh, the questions um, are uh, uh, for you. The first one, uh, what needs to be done when teachers to teach a vocabulary lesson with plenty of vocab items um, when their level is very low? Could you please repeat because the internet connection is not perfect. Sure. It was cut in. All right. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So the question goes as follows. What needs to be done when teachers are to teach vocabulary lesson with plenty of vocab items while their students level is very low? Okay, so we may apply a flipped uh, uh, lesson. So uh, students are supposed to read something at home. They will not know the vocabulary, but at least they will know the text. Uh, and it will be easier for us to introduce the new vocab. When I have um, a long article, I do not usually uh, use uh, the article in the class that when I teach the vocab. I concentrate on teaching the vocabulary itself. It may be through Quizlet or um, quizzes. Um, there are lots of um, digital tools, online um, platforms 
which help us teach vocabulary. Personally, I love Quizlet and I use it in my classes a lot. And uh, I have done a kind of a survey um, among my students and I asked them, how do you find, what do you find the most effective way of learning vocabulary? And all of them, um, I'm, I exaggerated, I'm sorry. A lot of them said that teaching, uh, learning vocabulary using Quizlet helps them a lot. It's a really great tool because, well, there is no time to describe Quizlet now. I'm sure a lot of teachers are familiar with Quizlet. So when I have a lot of vocab, I do not try to teach vocab and reading and answering the questions in the article. I'm, I want to divide the class into two sessions. So one class is only teaching vocabulary and it can be uh, by means of uh, many things, many different activities. And the next class, I want to use the article with the vocab and they, they see exactly how the vocab works. And we do comprehension questions and they, because they have already been taught the vocab, they have no difficulty answering the questions. So I don't know if it makes sense. Well, well answered, Ms. Joanna. Um, the last question for you is, pronunciation is indeed important but what if the students are not able to pronounce some words the right way even after and several times uh, because you know english can be difficult to pronounce especially to people um, who learn it as a third or fourth language like the case here in morocco well of course we cannot and by the way yeah. go ahead yeah, the question was from uh, Esma Abul Faraz. Okay, yes, there are some people who have definitely um, difficulty pronouncing uh, a lot of words correctly. And well, it's a very individual thing. We cannot spend the entire class teaching, uh, you know, a few words that you, our students have difficulty pronouncing uh, because it, it defeats the purpose. Um, I'm sure that when it, the pronounce, pronunciation is close to the what it should be like, um, we, we should find it you know, enough. And instead of having a student repeat a hundred times, we should say, okay, that's fine. I'm sure you will be understood because we cannot be uh, frustrating when we teach our students the correct pronunciation. I mean, frustrating for the students. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, Mr. Miss Joanna. Um, I'm sure our prospective teachers um, will learn a lot from the mistakes you have talked about today. I mean, they will consider and they will reflect upon these mistakes, of course. So thank you so much for the presentation. It was very insightful, very um, inspiring. Thank you so much. So now we move to our last speaker, who is Mr. Hussein Qasras, um, uh, the co-founder of DBF, of course. So Mr. Hussein Qasras is a Moroccan educator and trainer for more than 14 years of experience. He's the Cambridge Certified Trainer, also a teacher trainer at CRMF Rabat. Um, he's also a researcher on the implementation of 21st century skills in EFL classrooms and quality education. Hussein Qasras got two masters, MBA in Project Ma Management at Cardiff University, UK, Master of Education at Rabat Mohammed V University, Morocco. He's a founder and director of Rabat International ALT Conference and a TEFL program coordinator at both Tukaso Academy and the Canadian Academy. He has participated um, in several conferences, both in Morocco and abroad. 
he has trained and coached youth and teachers from different countries, such as Morocco, Qatar, Turkey, Spain, the UK, Algeria, Tunisia, and other countries. Um, his area of interest, of interest are color TSL, peace building, global education, business, administration, conflict resolution, etc. So Hussein Qasiras also wrote a book entitled Back Preparation for uh, second baccalaureate students, of course. Um, and in his presentation, he, he's going to talk to us about top tips to create a positive learning environment. So without any further delay, Mr. Hussein Qasras, the floor is yours. Thank you, Najwa and Asma, our great um, GBF members, and today you are wonderful moderators. Hello, everyone. Hello from Morocco. So my presentation today will be about how to create a positive learning environment, especially if you are teaching adolescent learners, teenagers. And uh, last year, I met some of my friends. And my friends are not teachers, by the way. They invited me to the cafe and they paid everything for me and they celebrated. And they said, why you are you celebrating? Okay, it's not my birthday. And, he said, and they said, you know, it's the first time we have learned that you are doing a great job because yes, you are a teacher. It was the lockdown. And then we were in the same house with our children for more than two months. Then we have learned how difficult the teacher's job is. So it was a very funny situation. I told them, yes, we love our job and it's difficult to teach teenagers, but we have to equip yourself with the techniques and strategies that will help you to create a very positive environment. And today I'm going to provide you with some 10 practical tips that you may use for your classes. So let me share my slides first, then we can start, all right. So, uh, Miss or Miss Neswa, do you see my full screen? Yes, I can see it. Just make sure to put it on full screen. Perfect. Now it's good. Go ahead. Wonderful. Good Thank luck. you. So, top tips to create a positive learning environment. So, I'm going to provide you with 10 ones. I'm not going to focus on, I mean, uh, using games or fun activities because we all know that games and fun activities do. I mean, uh, motivate and create positive environments, but I'm going to share with you um, other, I mean, tips. So these are the aims of my presentation. Number one, the introduction is a kind of warm-up activity that we have to deal with the strategies and some techniques um, uh, to create a, a very enjoyable, a very, I mean, positive learn environment. And at the end, there will be a, a conclusion. Good, so here, warm-up. I mean, from one to 10, these are some opinions, some views expressed by teachers. And here, our international audience, I want you just to write one agree or disagree, to agree or disagree. So let's do it all together. Number one, some teachers said, adolescent learners are lazy. So write D or A, agree or disagree. Number two, they are creative. Number three, they learn more languages. Number four, they usually cheat on exams. Oh my God. Number five, they are difficult to teach and handle. Number six, they feel bored easily. It's boring. Number seven, they are digital natives. Number eight, they need physical activities. Number nine, they are usually tired. And number 10, they often break rules. Okay, so here, or these are some opinions of teachers, okay. For me, number one, adolescent learners are lazy. I don't think so. It depends on the teacher's style of teaching. It depends on the classroom. It depends on the level of learners. They are creative. Um, Hussein, yes, even, they are creative. Sorry? Sorry to interrupt. Even the audience disagree with the, this statement. Thank you. What about... Number two, they are creative. Yes, they are. Yes, they agree. They learn more languages. Yes, yes. I agree. Yes. 
There are some students, they learn five. I have only two or three. So they are better than me. Wonderful. They usually cheat on exams. What do you think? Depends. Um, depends sometimes. on which uh, institution it, depends it on the is. School. It depends on the administration. It, de it depends on the teacher, him or herself. If you are an easygoing teacher, if you are a lazy teacher, you will let them cheat, of course. They are difficult to teach. What do you think? Also, it no, depends no, on, on, on the teachers, yeah. how they are going to deal with, with them. Thank you. To my humble experience, yes. Teenagers, adolescent learners are difficult to teach. There's a change going on in their body, the hormone, okay? So they, they are very moody. They are, they, they get, I mean, depressed. They get angry easily. So they are difficult to teach. That's why, I mean, you have to equip yourself with all the techniques and strategies of how to manage the classroom. Number six, they feel bored easily. Yes, I agree. Thank you. They are digital natives. Yes, 100%. absolutely. Yeah, teenagers, they open their eyes they found what? WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram, all these social media platforms, okay? So they are digital natives. Number eight, they need physical activities. They need to move in the classroom. Yes, I think so too. Agree or disagree? I agree. Wonderful. I agree too. They need to move. Number nine, they are usually tired. Agree, disagree. It depends on which time are you going to teach them. If it's the morning, if it's the afternoon. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, but scientifically and psychologically speaking, teenagers usually, I mean, they are usually tired. Again, there's a change going on inside their body, the hormone, the hormonal change. And number 10, they often break rules. Sometimes, yes. Yeah, sometimes you do. Yes, yeah. Adolescence is the stage of breaking rules, of challenging the challenge. Wonderful. Good. Look here. Who is he? Who is this person? He's a very famous figure. Bill Gates? <laughs> it's Bill so? Gates, yes. Thank you. So look here, teens challenge and break rules. Around age 11, Bill Gates started to become a problem for his parents. Can you imagine? Bill Gates was a big problem for his parents when he was 11. Now he's the great, the most successful businessman. So as his intellectual capacity grew, so did his argumentativeness. He refused to do the things his mom asked of him, like cleaning his room and showing up on time to dinner, according to the Wall Street Journal. If you would like to create a positive learning environment, you put it here that when you are teaching teenagers, adolescent learners, they will challenge you, they will disagree, they may re refuse, but you have to prepare yourself about all these issues. Good. Now, how can we approach our learners? A student at Michigan State University said, I spend a lot of money to go to school here. It would be nice if a professor knew my name. So my question to the audience, what is the tip that teachers should use to create a positive learning environment? Any volunteer, you can write in the chat box all our guest speakers here, they can mention one according to this code. I think they need to know their students and to address them. Thank you. By their names and to uh, make them like interactive. Yes, and um, also, also a good teacher for teenagers is someone who knows their name. So it is <laughs> necessary to call them by. Thank you. So learning their names, don't you answer, you, you know, because when you use you as if you are threatening, 
as if you are accusing, as if you are, I mean, blaming. But when you address, when you call learners by their names, you create a positive learning environment. Muhammad, Layla, James, would you mind answering this question? Oh my God, the teacher knows my name. My name. Yes, so, they feel special. There is sense of belonging. There is sense that you belong to the community. Okay, look here. Tip number one, call students by names. In learning student names posted on the National Teaching and Learning Forum, John Middendorf and Elizabeth Asborn at Indiana University wrote, a professor who does not know his or her students' names may be perceived as remote or unapproachable. So here, if you want to approach your learners, memorize, learn their names and call them by their names. Look here, calling students by their names helps to reduce what? Number one, the feeling of anonymity and number two, the feeling of isolation. But at the same time, it establishes less formal atmosphere, more comfortable atmosphere. And the teacher shows interest in students as individuals. You see now how it is strong to call your learners by their names. Now the question, how can you know? How can you memorize? How can you remember? Of course, it's very easy. You can use the name tag or name memorizing game or associations game. I'm gonna explain. Name tag. In the very beginning, when you meet your learners, you can tell them to take a piece of paper and they have to fold it in half and then everyone take a marker and they write their full name, Muhammad, Kamal, James, etc. After one, two weeks, whenever you wanna ask a learner to answer, you look at his name tag and you address him or her by his name. And of course, after one, two weeks, you will remember their names. Or number two, you can play the game, name memorizing game. You invite them and they can form a circle. And then the teacher will start like this. My name is Hussein, and my favorite food is couscous. The second person should repeat my name and my favorite food. The second, the third person should 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 I mean repeat my name and the second student's name, etc. And it goes like this. At the end, we start to learn about students' names and their favorite food or color, etc. Sorry, okay. Mr. Hussein, can I interrupt you? Yes, I have a question. So yeah. this is for like, like um, uh, for teachers. What about professors? How can they learn their students' names uh, when there are like two hundred students in the classroom? Wonderful! It's a very interesting question. That's why the, my topic is about teenagers. Good. Now there's a difference between a teacher and a lecturer. When you are giving a lecture, it's not like um, I mean teaching your learners because. When you are teaching, you have about 30 maximum or I mean 45 learners. So here you can learn. But if you have a very, a very large, I mean, classroom and a large number of learners, you are not supposed to learn all of them. But if you can learn only 10, 10 names, you create a very positive learn environment. As we say, one loaf is better than, than none. One loaf is better than none. So if you are teaching 100 learners, and if you can remember only 10, that would be that would be great. And that will create a positive learning environment. Yes, Asma? Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, most welcome. Good, number two, our future teachers, especially public school teachers, please keep it positive. Why? Because life is, a, is full of challenges and your job is to challenge the challenge. Why? Number one, you may have large classes in public schools, more than 45 or maybe 50 learners. Number two, you may have mixed ability classes. And number three, your colleagues, teachers, your parents, your friends, maybe, or they are toxic people. They speak only in terms of negative things. 
So please keep it positive. Large classes, no problem. A lot of ideas, a lot of human beings, a lot of people, a lot of, I mean, suggestions. So keep it positive. Mixed ability classes, no problem. I love teaching. High achievers, low achievers, I'm going to vary my instructions. I'm going to vary my activities. Grouping, I mean, uh, pair work, group work. Keep it positive because you have a mission and your mission is to satisfy the needs and wants of everyone. And number three, which is the most important for me, please, my piece of advice, avoid toxic people. Why? Because life has got two pictures. I mean, has got one picture. And one picture has got two sides, the good and the bad. So let's focus on the positive side. Okay. Now, first class, first contract. My question to our audience, what activity will you start with on the first day of school? And some of the, I mean, teachers and trainees said, of course, the code of conduct. And I agree. You can start with some, I mean, light activities, introducing each other, and then you move to code of conduct. And here, tip number three is empowering learners. We need to empower our learners. We need to listen to them. We need to take their ideas into account. Why? Because no one listens or listens to them. They go to their parents. Their parents say, I'm better than you. I have more experience than you, so listen to me. They go to other people. I'm older than you. I have more, ex more experiences, etc. So they find no one to listen to them. It's you that you have to discuss and you listen to, to them, what they need, what they want, what they prefer, etc. So look here, a student said, I don't like this expression, code of conduct. And remember in the very beginning, we said teenagers or adolescent learners challenge and break the rule or the rules. So can you think of any other expressions to use in the first contact with students instead of code of conduct. Why? Because when there is code, teenagers will say, oh, a code, it's a rule. I'm not gonna respect the rule. I'm gonna challenge it. I'm gonna bring, break the, the I mean, the, the rule. So why not giving them a very nice expression that they may agree on? And some of them said, look here, very interesting. Some of, some of my learners said, teacher, I would prefer classroom va values more than code of conduct. Others mentioned classroom principles more than code of conduct. I said, great, let's go for it. So here I empowered my learners and implicitly I created a very positive learning environment. Wonderful. Tip number four, as Kukla said, share with your learners. And here number four, Sharing is caring. One of my, one of the best techniques that I use in my classes to create an enjoyable, uh, a positive learning environment, and then to build a good rapport between you and your learners, telling stories. Because stories go to the heart. And once they go to the heart, they change behavior. And then you create a, positive and then your learners become loyal to you how look here storytelling adds more fun and it's about more mystery more excitement and more behavior influencing reports and this is the most important when my learners are very tired when my learners are very depressed when my learners are very sad about life they are pessimistic. I stop teaching. I don't care now about teaching. I start to give them and to narrate and tell them about inspiring stories. Do you know that one of my friends, when I was at the high school, he repeated three times, then he was kicked out and he applied again and he got accepted to study again. So the fourth time. Can you imagine, he repeats the first, the second, the third, and the fourth time he made it. 
and he got his bag and he went to the university. Can you imagine now? He is a, a judge in the court. He is a, a successful person, which means the more mistakes you make, the better you become as a learner. No problem, make mistakes. And then so says, oh my God, teacher, are you sure? But he repeated several times and now he's a successful person. Yes, I'm a teacher. I have made, and I, I'm still making a lot of mistakes. And when we make mistakes, we learn. It's natural. Okay, so please share with your learners inspiring story. Number five, don't be mean, be generous. Praise your learners and don't praise them just good, good job, well done, beautiful, brilliant. Don't be mean, bring chocolate, candies, a banana, for example, and you give them, give them certificates. The best students in June, in July, in March. And then there is recognition. They feel that they are very important in this class, okay? So praise them. And here, Jill Hadfield said, in Classroom Dynamics, 1993, Oxford University Press, that a positive group atmosphere can have a beneficial effect on the, on the morale, motivation, and self-image of its members, and thus significantly affect their learning. Please, don't be mean, bring chocolate, candies, and then you can say, great, wonderful, brilliant. Good. Number six, surprise your learners. Because teenagers, adolescents, they like to be surprised. So adding surprises in your classrooms, how? These are some, so you can start your lessons with building interest. How can you build interest? Number one, you can start with a surprising fact. Number two, using fun games. Number three, teacher sings and students listen because learners are crazy about listening to their teachers and their teachers are singing, okay. I am sailing, I am sailing home again, cross the sea. I am flying, I am flying home again, no problem. I am swimming, etc. Even though I don't have a good voice, but I create a very positive learning environment. D, using interesting pictures, realia, posters, visuals in general. And the last one, which is the most important, why not inviting a guest to the classroom? You can, in, you can invite your, I mean, your ex-student who is now a successful learner, then he or she can share with your learners. You can invite a teacher who is going to give them a talk about a certain topic, etc. Look here, I want to teach animals lesson or topic. I'm going to start with a surprising fact. Here, my learners, I want you to write T, true or F, false. So let's start. I would like to give you three minutes. Number one, all dogs dream. Number two, slugs have noses. Number three, cows can recognize their names. Number four, only female mosquitoes bite. Number five, a snail can sleep for three years at a time. Oh my God, three years. Number six, wild dolphins call each other by name. Oh, flipper, etc. Flipper. Now, one minute, write T or F, one to, to six. What do you think? <coughs> Well, as Matt said that for the first statement, it's true. Uh -huh. So number one is true. Number two. Yeah, our guest speakers here.
or moderators yeah i don't actually know about the second one but i can guess maybe false good so here ines said number one true intisar true okay I suspect that number three is true. All right. Yes. 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 Did I also number say five. true? And I believe number four is true. Uh, All right. <laughs> Great. Number, number four is All right. So number one is true. Number two is true. All of them are true. <laughs> so what do you okay. think? <laughs> so okay. So we are adding a we are adding surprising fact. All of them are true. So do you think it's a nice activity that creates a positive learning environment, adding surprises? What do you think our guest speakers and moderators and even the audience? Yes, absolutely. Surprising students is always a good thing. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Number seven, listen to your learners. Active listening. Why, as teachers, we talk more than we listen? And then our TTT is high and STT is low. So please, we listen to our learners. Why? We listen to about their, uh, I mean, their needs, their wants, their interests, um, their preferences, etc. I would like to teach them or to use some games. And there are different types of games, by the way. Online games, board games, offline games. Great. Who is my customer? The students. So I have to satisfy the needs or I have to meet the needs and wants of my learners. I have to ask them. It's a kind of learning style quiz. What games they want or they prefer, online, offline, or board games, or all of them. If I have got, I mean, the majority of my learners are visual learners, then I'm going to depend on online. If all my learners are kinesthetic learners, then I'm going to design games based on physical movements. That's why we have to listen to our learners. Listen to the suggestions, their opinions, okay? And then you will indirectly create a positive learn environment. This is how we improve and develop, I mean, our learners 21st century skills. We empower them and improve their, I mean, listening skills. And the most important is listening actively. Number eight, you have a large class, 45 learners, keep them busy or can you continue? Keep them busy or? There will be noise. Or there will be noise. There are here one, two, three, four, five. And number one, we have four letters, four letters, four letters, three letters, and five letters. It's an expression. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Keep them busy, keep busy or? Or they will keep you busy. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Jamel. Yeah, you are very, <laughs> yeah, you know this expression. Interesting. Classes. Keep them busy or they will keep you busy. Then there is chaos, noise in your classes and there is no positive learning environment. Why? To avoid noise, to avoid distractions and to avoid troublemakers in the classroom. And Raja here on Facebook said they will keep you busy. Thank you. One of, the, of my favorites, variety. And we say variety is, again, one, two, three, four. Variety is the... Fun. Spice of life. <laughs> yes, so Mr. Jamal, I know you are very, um, I mean, familiar with these uh, I mean, expressions in our uh, eighth grade classes. So variety is the spice of life. You are teaching different learners, different styles, different abilities. So vary your instructions, vary your objectives, vary your mode of work, pair work, group work, vary your tasks. I mean, WH questions, matching, I mean, task completion, true, false, correct the mistakes, vary your role, monitor, assessor, prompter, etc. Okay. 
vary your methods, your approaches. So variety is the spice of life because take it for granted. Whenever you teach a class, you are not teaching one level and you are not teaching one style. You are teaching different styles and different learning styles, different abilities. Great. Number 10, English class. Do you love teaching? Are you passionate? So you have to establish English class. If you apply for teaching for money, financial purposes, I'm sorry, you will not get a lot of money. Teaching or as a teacher, you will not get a lot of money. But if you are passionate, if you love teaching people, if you want to change humanity, if you love being next to children, then go for teaching. Now, teaching and learning, both do not take place only in the classroom, but outside how you establish English clubs, book club, reading club, drama club, I mean, uh, theater club, singing club, grammar club, public speaking club, and then you will see that you are creating a very enjoyable, a very positive environment, and then you are changing lives. Let me um, share with you my experience with, I mean, establishing English clubs. Look here, we established, I mean, a club named English Club, and then we collaborate with GBF back to five years, I mean, five years ago. And here we invited students to visit the parliament. And here students belong to different schools. Can you imagine? All of them have never been to the parliament. And now they went there, why? Because Moroccan youth, Moroccan young people are not interested in politics. There's a topic in the second back about if young people are interested in political life. And the majority said no. Now, we give them this opportunity to visit the parliament, to listen to the members there about the lectures. And one of the parliament members gave them a lecture in English. And then they said, wow, we have to participate. Why? Because if we do not participate, then wrong people will take other places. So we have to participate, we have to vote to choose the right person for the right place, the right position. Look English clubs how, I mean, uh, establish a positive and changed or have changed the way youth or young people think about politics. And here, our young students, all the time from the house, the home to school, from school to the house, to the home. They don't know about non-governmental organizations. They don't know about volunteering. They don't know about sacrifice. They don't know about helping, uh, I mean, others. So we invite them to visit a non-governmental organization called, give them a presentation, a workshop about very interesting topics, youth empowerment. And then young students said, wow, it's not only the school that can help you to flourish, but also if you engage in, I mean, in, or if, you, if you become a part of a non-governmental organization, you will learn and learn a lot. And then you will start a good networking with other associations. And then we will learn about the life skills, the soft skills. So here, we as teachers, we have to organize competitions, singing, dancing, drama, theater, reading, etc. And here, Global Bus Foundation, in collaboration with the Sally Delegate, they organized a competition named Students Got Talent. And our learners participated here: poetry, public speaking, singing, drama, break dance, and drawing. What is very interesting, the competition lasts about five months. And can you imagine that the students who qualified to the final, to the final, all of them or the majority, 20 students were not good 
at school subjects. They were not good. They were not brilliant students, but they have talents. They have talents. And they said, teacher, you opened a new door that we didn't know. We thought that school is the only place where you can learn and get a job. But now talents can help us to get a job. And very interesting for breakdance, one of my learners, my students, I still remember his name is uh, Salman Gzizir. He won this competition about breakdance. And then a company in Turkey contacted him to come and work there because we published, we posted his work on social media. Another student who won the singing competition, I mean, other companies learned about her and invited her to participate in a tea, on a TV program in Morocco. You see how English club or English clubs inspire students and change their life for the best. Look, the result. One of the students who participated in these, I mean, uh, um, competitions or uh, clubs, so she said, hello, I hope you are fine. I, I just want to thank you for all these amazing moments you gave us and for giving us the, the opportunity of showing our talents to the public. I didn't even know if I can perform in front of, I mean, others until you came to our school, Hassan II, and made my parents proud of me. Thank you so, 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 so much. And also our visit to the parliament was one of the things that I thought will never happen, but you made it real. Thank you. We met new friends, new people, new teachers, new family. And even if I hadn't won the prize, I won the heart of new people. Thank you. I will never forget these moments. You see, she's inspired by English clubs. She's inspired by doing activities outside the classroom. This is how we create a very positive learning environment. The conclusion, teaching adolescent learners is challenging. Yes, it's challenging, but rewarding. Look here, it's very rewarding. Read what Hajar said, she's inspired to approach and motivate students. Your lesson should be based on the three, variety, authenticity, and flexibility. Thank you. Mr. Hussein, we enjoyed your presentation. You have talked about some top tips to deal with teenagers so we can create a positive learning um, environment. I'm sure these tips are of great help for our future teachers. I mean, the audience loved the activities you've provided and they loved the way you inspired these teenagers. Um, so here is a question for you. The first one is, uh, do you think that we should often tolerate disruptive behaviors from uh, troublemaker students or not? Like how often should we tolerate these, these uh, behaviors? Thank you. <laughs> so it depends on the age of learners. Okay, now my presentation is about um, teaching adolescent learners. And we said one of the characteristics of teenagers I mean, they, um, they challenge, they break rules and they make uh, create problems. Good. If a learner, uh, okay, I mean, uh, create some troubles in the classroom, one of the strategies that we use, uh, we ignore. The first time you ignore, okay. And then you keep and maintain the eye contact. I'm here, I know that you, the reason behind that noise, okay, good. Now, if the behavior is improved and the students is okay, that's great, no problem. Now, if the students repeat the same behavior the second time, good, all right, good, do activity number three. I give you five minutes, work alone. And then students are working alone. Then you go to the learner, you whisper next to his, please, I know you are the reason behind this problem. I respect you, please. At the end, I want to talk to you. 
success because we don't have to embarrass them in front of everyone because teenagers, they will challenge you if you embarrass them. Good. Now, let's imagine the second strategy did not work. Now you are teaching and the students repeats or repeated the third, I mean the second or the third time. Here, you have to confront, not physically, but you say, all right, said, please, I would like to keep quiet so as not to waste time, but please, I would like to talk to you at the end because now I address everyone. Thank you. Now continue working, they work. Good. At the end, everyone is gonna leave the classroom and then, one of the best strategies, you calm down the learner. The learner is calmed down now and there is no one there. So the learner will feel shy, they will, or he will listen to you. So please, my piece of advice, when a learner creates certain noise in the classroom, don't jump. No, your job is to re decrease, to reduce conflict and not to increase. How can you reduce? Eye contact, keep quiet, give him a task, go to him or her, talk to him privately. This is how we decrease conflict. Okay, I hope my answer is clear. Yes, it is indeed, Mr. Hussein. Thank you so much. Um, these tips were really um, amazing. In the audience, is thanking you for the wonderful presentation and for the insightful and interesting ideas that you have shared with, uh, with us. So um, on behalf of GBF and CRMF, I would love to thank our international speakers <laughs> who accepted our invitation today and who made a wonderful, who made this webinar a wonderful uh, webinar. Uh, so Mr. Hussein, if you, if you want to add anything, if you want to yes, say something before. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, Asma Abul Faraj and Najwa Al Arabi, one of the, I mean, the the powerful young female leaders at GBF. They are doing a great job and they are role models for all Moroccan. I mean, uh, young people there and I'm very uh, proud of them for the great work they do. And uh, I'm sure that uh, inshallah soon you will be um, leaders here in Morocco and leading English language um, teaching community. Yes, now it's uh, for discussions, five to 10 minutes. Yes. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Mr. Yes, Hussein, sure. for, uh, for everything. Um, yes, does anybody want to add anything before we move to like the end? Does anybody from our guest speakers have any questions for Mr. Hussein or for any other speaker? Um, there is a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, it says like, uh, I have a question concerning adolescents' behaviors. You mentioned that they try to cheat in a situation where the student treat the teacher to cause him or her harm. If she or he did not let her or him cheat, what should the teacher do in such a situation? Like if the <laughs> teacher does not allow students to cheat, what, do, what are you going to do in? I don't get your point. So the teacher will not allow learners to okay. cheat. Yes, and then the like the students will be like uh, will not tolerate it, will not accept it. So what are we going to do in this in this case? So let me share with you a very nice story. When I was teaching at the high school, uh, you know uh, there is teachers movement. You can move from one or two years to another school or another city. And I moved to another uh, school and that school is considered one of the oldest I mean, schools in the city. And it was uh, a difficult situation to teach there because uh, maybe because the school is located uh, in a very popular uh, neighborhood. And it was the first time I teach there and it was the time for giving students exams, okay? And then it was the, the exam day. And then I, I, used to, I distributed the exam sheets and then they started cheating. I said, listen, it's an exam. They said, it's a habit here, it's okay. And then I was kind of trying to, um, to convince them and trying to monitor them and trying to control them. But it was beyond my will because 
the majority of learners, uh, I mean, uh, it was a kind of a, a, a habit there to cheat. So what did I do? I told them to, I mean, uh, uh, there is no exam uh, now. And then I refused all the exam sheets. And then I went to the administration and asked about the situation here. It's okay to, uh, if uh, I'm gonna be somehow very tough, I mean, with learners, because the majority here, when I give them the exam, they all started cheating. Yeah, the, I mean, the administration was very supportive. And then the coming, I, I mean, week, we had some, I mean, admins, I mean, who came and joined me in my class to, I mean, to monitor and control all the class. And this way it works. So sometimes it's beyond your will, then you need help from the, from the admin. You cannot solve the problem. It's collaboration. And you know, one of the 21st century skills is collaboration. You have to collaborate with the admin, with your colleagues, with your parents, with everyone, especially if there is an, an issue going on in your school. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, Mr. Hussein Qasras. I'm sure uh, yeah. you're... I'm sorry. Yes, 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 go ahead. I want to say that we as teachers, our role is to increase students' awareness that if they teach, they act against themselves. Because um, <laughs> what if your friend whom you are helping cheat in the exam does better than you and you have studied very hard and unfortunately your friend who did not study at all is going to write an exam you know much uh, in a much uh, better way so we'll get a better mark so we should um, increase uh, their awareness that it's important they do not cheat, they do not let others cheat off their papers. Um, so this is uh, our one of our tasks as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, I do yeah. have a question though. Uh, so of course, I, I do think that teachers <laughs> should know their learners a lot and, and they should know like how their psychology is. But um, for example, Last week, I was tutoring my cousin, and he is very, very hyperactive. Like, I don't know if this is a, is a disability, but he does not really know how to sit down and, and steady. He needs to be active. Uh, his, his buddy also needs to be, I mean, moving, and he's easily bored. So how can we deal with situations like this, for example, in the classroom? when there are students who want to, who are basically kinesthetic? Yeah, my question is for anyone who wants to answer. Yes, uh, so basically one of the, I mean, the hard tasks the teachers may have is when you have a learner or two or three, they keep moving all the time. They, all, they are over, I mean, uh, uh, active, okay, in the classroom. So if you are teaching again teenagers and you have one Ismail or Karim or Leila or James or Laura, I mean, a very, I mean, uh, active negatively in the sense of being negative. Number one, you can um, bring him or her in front of you. Because if you put him or her in the middle or in the center of the classroom, he's going to, I mean, distract, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, students. And then, uh, I mean, uh, as a teacher, you should know that kinesthetic learners, are, they are like this, okay? They move a lot. So you have to design activities that are based on physical movements, okay? For example, go to the board and write. Ismail, because I know Ismail is a, a, a very, I mean, um, uh, proactive Active learner. Or, and, yeah. Yes, and a kinesthetic learner. So whenever there is, uh, I mean, I, I mean, um, activities based on uh, physical mo movements, I would encourage him or her. When, when I want um, someone to write on the board uh, uh, on purpose, I'm going to call only that uh, kinesthetic learner because here we, we satisfy the different learning needs. But at the same time, the code of conduct, as I said in the very beginning, is very important. Before you talk, raise your hand. If you, if you need something, ask the teacher. If you want to, I mean, to talk to someone else, ask the teacher. If you want to go to the bathroom or somewhere, ask. So the code of conduct also is very important, but 
uh, at the end, uh, you may have some issues with these types of learners, but if you love teaching, you will see them as sweet and as candies, even though they do these problems, but you love the way, like, like um, if you have children, you know, your kids, uh, a, a four month baby cry all the time. However, you love him or you love her. The same for teaching children. Even though they do a lot of problems, you have to love their problems. You have to love their misbehaviors. But at the same time, you try to improve them. Okay, this is uh, how we, uh, I mean, we create positive learning environment. And we as teachers, if you are a teacher, you have to love anything that will come from your learners, being negative or being positive. Yes. Yes, that's what unconditional love is, right? <laughs> no matter what did you, they do, you should love them. Yes, and then I would like to add that our bodies are made to move. <laughs> uh, our brains require movement to learn uh, and we require sunshine and light and fresh air and movement. And so uh, when you have a child who is moving, when the school tells them to not be moving, uh, perhaps this child is, is, is advocating for their rights <laughs> to be a human, to be a human body in a system not created well for human bodies. So one thing that I always start with, uh, when, I, when I recognize that, that a student is going to um, require a lot more movement and, and uh, they need this, um, immediately I focus on developing a positive relationship with the student and the student's <laughs> family. Because this student will probably, if they come to me in ninth grade, the student has had eight years of teachers telling them that they are bad, that they are a bad student, that they are a bad learner. And they, they, their families have experienced this. And the student also, if the student comes to me after lunch, uh, before lunch, the student has gotten in trouble maybe four or five times negative messages from other teachers and other subjects and other classrooms. So building them up uh, and making sure that uh, they feel like they belong in school, it matters so much because all of the messages they've received are telling them something very different. You, you do not belong in school. Uh, you're in trouble for this and for that. So uh, relationships really matter. And then you can do the other things to help them feel important. Help me write this on the board. Take this piece of paper to the principal's office. Sometimes I would have a file with them, with papers in it. And you know, I could I just knew I could send the student with the file to another teacher or an, or the principal's office. And it was just part of our agreement. I would talk to the other teacher. Look, when when the student is feeling restless, I'm going to send them to you with this these papers. You don't need to read the papers, <laughs> but the student needs to move and needs to feel important. So, very inspiring. Thank you, Mr. Hussein, and thank you, Ms. Uh, Janice. Thank you so much for your answer. Any more questions? Yes, Mr. Jamal. So, let's um, close today's uh, event. Any word, Mr. Jamal Slimani? Activate your mic, please. Your mic. Yes. I would like to thank everybody for the time and then for their excellent presentations. And uh, I hope the audience also learned uh, from um, all the presentations. And, um, and we're here to share knowledge. We're here to learn from other people. We are here to learn from each other. And I hope we will have another session and then that will be also as um, instructive as this one. And um, I would like to um, thank again our uh, foreign guests. And um, I'm thankful that this technology exists now. There is no excuse for not having encounters like this one. Uh, thanks to Zoom and thanks of course to good organizers like Sih Hussein and uh, his uh, moderators, um, Asma and Najwa. So um, it's a pleasure to have met you and I uh, hope we will see you soon. Yes, thank, thank you all you. for so, coming. Thank you, Mr. Simani. Yeah, and thank, thank you, you Poland. Everyone. Thank you, Poland, Jonah. Thank you, the US, Janice. Thank you, Greece, Kokolas. Thank you, Morocco, Jamal, Hussein, Asma, 
and Nejwa, you were great. And it's our pleasure to welcome you anytime here to share with our international audience. And of course, uh, um, I mean, the other events uh, are going to come soon. Okay, more events, more, I mean, English language teaching webinars. And if you are interested in English language teaching webinars, Global Bus Foundation, every Friday at 8 p.m. Moroccan local time, I mean, uh, host and welcome international guest speakers to share their knowledge, their skills or expertise in topics related to English language teaching. Thank you and see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye. 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 Thank you.